insider tips and the latest consumer news, from warnings about knockoff weight loss drugs to what you should consider before buying pet insurance. It's all coming your way. But first, I'll look at new technology that aims to make school buses safer for students. This is video from a school bus in North Carolina. Watch as the students on the left attempt to cross the road to board the bus, but then are nearly run over. And this Ohio bus driver hailed as a hero after saving a student from being hit by that car. These incidents are known as stop arm violations. A new survey estimates this happens more than 43 million times every year. These stop arm violations can have deadly consequences. According to a government report, 13 year old Evelyn Gurney was run over and killed by a driver in Wisconsin as she prepared to board her bus. The report stated the stop arm was deployed when the driver swerved around it and struck her. But new technology aims to make it safer for students by enabling buses to communicate directly with cars. I'm here in Indiana at the test track for IC Bus. It's the nation's largest bus manufacturer, and I'm going to show you for the first time how it all works. It's called Cellular Vehicle to Everything, or CV2X for short, and it's being developed by dozens of automakers and tech companies, including Audi and IC Bus. It just takes safety to the next level. With me is Justina Morrison from IC Bus. The bus driver slows down and extends the stop sign. Heading toward us is a car also outfitted with CV2X technology. That screen alerts the bus driver of the approaching vehicle. Near my vehicle in motion. As the car gets closer, the technology senses it has not slowed down, once again warning the bus driver, don't let kids off that bus. High speed vehicle approaching. What is that screen telling the bus driver right now? It's telling the bus driver how fast the car is approaching, how close the car is to the school bus, as well as from what direction that car is approaching the bus. So we saw how this tech works on buses, but what about for drivers of other cars who really need to know where those kids are? With me is Palm Mohotra from Audi to talk about what the experience is like behind the wheel. Palm, how will this prevent crashes? So the technology that we have in the Audi e-tron actually communicates directly with the school bus up to 10 times a second. And it doesn't matter if the driver in the vehicle is actually able to see the other vehicle hmm. or not because it can look around corners, it can sense a vehicle through an obstruction like another vehicle. And this is how we prevent accidents on the road and save lives. Let's see how it works. This time the bus is stopped, but I can't see it because it's hidden from view by that semi-truck. As I approach, I get a warning on my dashboard. Wow, so Palm, I don't even see a bus or any stop signs, but already the car is telling me something's ahead. Exactly, and it's telling you, heads up, you need to slow down. Okay, let's see what happens when I don't slow down. And there's the warning. It gives me an extra time to react, and that can be the difference between life and death. Absolutely. We try it again, now with the semi-truck behind the bus as I maneuver to pass it. This is a very real scenario. A big rig slowed down in front of me, I don't see anything, so I'm just gonna change lanes around it, but. I'm already getting an indication. There's a school bus. Now I'm getting the stop indication. And if I don't stop, there's that alert. And I had plenty of time to stop. And CV2X isn't limited to buses and cars. It can be used to alert drivers to approaching emergency vehicles, upcoming construction zones, bicycles, even pedestrians, as long as they're equipped with the cellular technology but the safety benefit that it delivers on the road is incredible. Incredible safety when everything on the road can communicate so we can avoid scenes like this. The technology is not exclusive to Audi or Navistar. Nearly every automaker is working to get this into their vehicles as quickly as possible. Audi says they're hoping it will be standard technology in their vehicles within three to five years. Now, if you think that's a long time, the FCC actually set aside the bandwidth to make this all possible all the way back in 1999. Next, drugs like Ozempic are being used for weight loss, and recently, more websites have been selling knockoff versions. But are they safe? These days, it seems like everyone is looking to shed a few pounds. Baby, the hype is real. But as the craze for using diabetes drugs for weight loss grows, so too is the emerging market to get so-called knockoff versions of these popular medications, all without a prescription. A new report by the Wall Street Journal found more than 50 websites selling semaglutide and terzepatide, the active ingredients in diabetes drugs like Ozempic and Manjaro. Anytime demand vastly outstrips supply, entrepreneurs will step into the breach. 
While nearly all of the websites have disclaimers that the ingredients are not for human consumption, the journal found some had instructions for how people could use the substances on their own. They're not verifying who you are, and they do things like prefer to be paid in Bitcoin. The paper also says at least 18 of the sites have run ads on Instagram and Facebook in recent months, including ones like these from SAF Research, offering huge gains and a buy one, get two free deal on their vials of semaglutide. Facebook and Instagram's parent company Meta says they've removed ads for the sites on their platforms after being flagged by the journal, telling NBC News in a statement reading in part, our policies prohibit the advertisement of prescription drugs without the proper authorization and approval. On its website, SAF Research offers numerous disclaimers stressing their products are not dietary supplements, but instead research chemicals for laboratory use only. But some are choosing to ignore these kinds of warnings. Across the websites they reviewed, the journal found that a month's supply of the ingredients cost around $100 to $200, compared to brand name drugs like Ozempic, which can cost around $1,000 a month without insurance. Lori Sicatello says she was prescribed Ozempic for her type 2 diabetes last year. Months later, she hit an insurance coverage gap, making it too expensive for her. They said now it's going to be $754. So she began taking research-grade semaglutide that her friend found online for about $100 a month. What's really in this? What am I, what am I taking here? By the end of the month, I wasn't comfortable with taking it anymore. The FDA is now sounding the alarm about the potential dangers of buying these ingredients online, saying in a statement that they advise consumers to not purchase peptides marketed as sold for research use and mix, ingest, or inject them. There are no FDA-approved generic versions of these substances, and drug makers Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly say they don't supply their ingredients to companies selling research substances. Earlier this year, our NBC News investigation found more than a dozen telehealth websites advertising Ozempic for weight loss. I experienced firsthand just how easy it was to get these medications online at a low cost. Admit my request. I had my Ozempic prescription by the very next day. My producer also got a prescription. This is Jamie. No one ever saw us on video or in person, and neither of us has diabetes or would be medically defined as obese. While it may seem like it's becoming easier than ever to get your hands on these drugs, experts say doing so comes at your own risk. I really advise patients to steer clear of the online versions because we just can't control the quality or the safety in those cases. The Wall Street Journal tells us some of the websites they contacted have already been taken down. We reached out to SAF Research for additional comment. We have not heard back. The website says they use different marketing tools to reach their audience and that none of their ads make claims that could send the wrong message about their products. SAF also emphasizes they do not sell supplements or medications. With so many counterfeit options, Novo Nordisk actually launched a website, semaglutide.com, to help people spot the difference between what's real and what's fake. Coming up, is pet insurance really worth it? How to decide if it's right for you. Plus, tips to help college students eat healthier on a budget.
Welcome back, Americans. We love our pets, and more owners are now getting pet insurance. But it can be confusing to figure out if it makes sense for you. We help break it down. We love our pets like family. An estimated 111 million American households have a dog or cat. And just like any member of the family, health care is important, but an emergency vet visit can cost between $250 to $1,600. It's prompted a booming business in the U.S., pet insurance. The number of policies purchased at the end of last year has risen nearly 93% since 2019. It's another kid. You know, I have three daughters and I have Lucy. You got her as a puppy and immediately you thought, this is a good idea to have insurance for our pet. Why? Well, just like you would insure your children. You want to make sure, you know, if something bad happens that they're protected. Jeff Foos purchased a policy from True Panion, among the nation's largest pet insurance companies. He says his coverage started at $33 a month for Lucy. But after nine years, the cost has risen to almost $80 a month. That's a 141% increase. Foos says in some years, his rate increased more than the 20% his policy said it would never exceed annually. Do you think this was a worthwhile investment? Absolutely not. It can be hard to tell if pet insurance is worth it for you. We requested quotes from five popular companies using Bruno, a three-year-old mixed breed dog. For similar coverage and a deductible between two to $500, take a look at the rates. Embrace at the low end at $41 a month, Trupanion the highest at $167. None covers routine exams. We would absolutely recommend that you get your insurance when you have a puppy or kitten because that's when a pet doesn't have any pre-existing conditions. Margie Tooth is the president of Trupanion. The company brought in almost a billion dollars in revenue last year and says it's paid two billion in claims since the company was founded in 2000. We asked her about Jeff Foose's case and other complaints that Trupanion has raised its premiums to unaffordable levels that are far higher than vet care inflation. You said it's important to your company not to make consumers feel like it's a bait and switch, and yet we have talked to some who feel like they're not getting what they were promised. How do you respond to those criticisms? It's very disappointing to hear that people feel that way. I think we, we work very hard to ensure that we're explaining our value proposition and that we make it clear to people when they sign up with us that your price may change. Do you think there's enough regulation to make this industry uh, transparent and to help consumers really understand the pricing models? I do not. I think it's changing. I think it needs to continue to change more. It's a bad financial product. Kevin Brassler is executive editor for Consumers Checkbook, a nonprofit providing price research and consumer advice. In the case of pet insurance, we found that overall, compared to the payouts and the premiums you have to pay and all the other out-of-pocket expenses, they're generally really bad deals for most pet owners. Do you think it's a better idea to set aside some money in a rainy day fund rather than paying these premiums? Yeah, I mean, you're going to do far better off financially in the long run by taking those premiums that you'd pay to pet insurance companies and just saving them and taking care of your pet's costs out of pocket. If you want to buy pet insurance, Brassler says check accident-only policies to cover emergencies like car accidents or poisoning and look for a higher deductible plan to lower your monthly payments. Foose says he would have been better off with a rainy day fund. If you had just paid out of pocket for Lucy's incidents, mm -hmm. would you be ahead? I'd be ahead of about $2,300, $2,400. We reached out to Embrace. They told us their policies provide peace of mind and like insurance for homes, cars, and people, pets should be protected too. Up next, healthy and budget-friendly meal ideas for college students. And later, a look at what's fueling the growth in popularity of stick shifts. Consumer Confidential continues after this break.
Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. College students, they're not making the grade when it comes to healthy eating. So I hit the grocery aisles with a chef who specializes in healthy and budget-friendly meals. With nearly 3 million freshmen expected to attend college this fall, many students will live on their own for the very first time. A fresh taste of freedom served with a full plate of new responsibilities. Gail Cresci, a registered dietitian at Cleveland Clinic Children's, says as first-year students adapt to college life, some may struggle to maintain a healthy diet, a time I remember all too well. It was a lot of pizza, it was a lot of cookies, it was a lot of eating late at night, and a lot of contributing factors to the so-called freshman 15. Where are some areas that calories like to hide and sneak into a first-year student's diet? We find hidden calories in things like alcohol. Another area is with coffee. You may get some of those extra syrup flavorings, a whipped cream that's on those coffees. We see a lot of extra calories with fast food. What are three things you might advise a first year student when it comes to eating healthy? Avoid eating late at night if at all possible. And you're going to be hungry during the day, so to have some healthy snacks available that are quick grab and go. Another thing is to make sure you're drinking adequate water. Crashy also recommends eating 20 to 30 grams of protein at each meal, which equals about three ounces of chicken breast or lean beef. This is where you live okay. when you're in college. We've called on chef, TV personality, and senior food editor for Budget Bites, Monte Carlo. Monty, class is in session. Yes. Clearly we got the assignment. You're Kale University. Okay, School of Hard Knocks. Yes, I'm representing University of San Francisco. So you say that when kids are off on their own for the first time, mm -hmm. often cooking on a budget, you gotta start with an A-plus grocery list. You have to start with an A-plus grocery list. And the best part is it's a really cheesy, easy one. Let's go. Let's start with fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay. It's important to eat nutritiously, yes. but this stuff is expensive and it doesn't always last a long time. No, it doesn't. This has the life of like a Disney star, what, like 24 hours? But the best deal for you when you want berries in your life is to go frozen. These fresh blueberries cost about five bucks a pound, but for the same price, you can buy three times that amount frozen, adding them to oatmeal, yogurt, or smoothies. Let's talk about packaged produce. Yes. What's your tip here? Do not do it. It's a no-no? No, come on, you're gonna pay like five dollars for poor little pieces of corn when you could buy this for 59 cents a pop, right? Ah. Just peel it, bro, it's not that hard. And right. if you have a microwave, you have fabulous fresh corn. Carlo, who teaches college cooking classes, says when it comes to appliances, every dorm room or apartment also needs a coffee pot. You can use it to make soups, you can use it to make eggs, anything that you would stew or heat up in a pot, you can make in a coffee pot. The next part of our lesson, a study of hot deals on frozen meals. A staple of college life is pizza. pizza. But you don't want to be dialing that pizza delivery company. No. One pepperoni pizza is $17. You can get three for $10. Carlos suggests stocking up on a variety of store brand frozen vegetables to use as pizza toppings. It's starting to feel kind of gourmet. Okay. Or as a way to help another college classic earn some extra credit. Are you ready for the pop quiz? I guess so. Which country consumes the most ramen per person per year? USA? No! Vietnam! Yeah! We love our ramen. Costing three bucks for six servings, Carlo partially cooks the noodles and divides them into mason jars with the veggies. When you're ready to eat, you add a little water, a little broth, you put it in the microwave, and you're set. So you just pre-make these ramen jars? Yes using your noodle to find a cart full of savings. Winning. Class dismissed. Ah! For other budget-friendly tips, consider shopping store brands and downloading the store's app for extra savings. Also, shop the less popular cuts of meat, like chicken thighs or sirloin tip steaks, and add beans to meat dishes for more bulk and protein. Now, let's switch gears to the recent growth in popularity of stick shifts. I hadn't driven a stick in nearly 20 years, so we found the best instructor to rev up my skills, a NASCAR champion. Drift, slide, side to side. But before we get into my skills behind the wheel, let's revisit that time in 2019. When Dylan and Al taught Craig and Chanel how to drive with a manual transmission. I didn't even feel you change it. Because I'm that good. As for me in 2023, you decide. Let's take it for a spin.
right, all right. So that's not exactly how it went, but I was in for some fun. Today we're outside City Field here in Queens, New York, and this this is the brand new Mustang Dark Horse. It is a manual transmission car. I can't wait to take it for a spin. Problem is, the last time I drove a stick was 15 years ago. But lucky for me, look who we have here, NASCAR Hi. driver, Coca-Cola 600 champion, Ryan Blaney. Hi, thank you so much you? for being here. Yeah. So there is a rise in interest in these manual transmission cars. What's the appeal, Ryan? I feel like the appeal of manuals is, it kind of makes the driver feel one with the car. You're engaged. It, yeah, that's a great word. It makes you very engaged with the car. So I'm really excited to show you around it. Okay, so you'll stay with me as I kind of like go oh, yeah. through the bumps? I got you. <laughs> All right, let's do it. All right. I'm the first TV journalist to drive the dark horse. I know, tough assignment. What is the first thing I should be thinking about? So first thing is, left foot in on the clutch. Okay. As you're letting your left foot off the clutch, and you know, your right foot's going down to the gas, and it's like at an even motion. And so a lot of people kind of dump the clutch, and that's when you get like the big herky jerky. Did you bring a bar bag? Yeah. There we go, all right, all right. You know, it's like riding the bike. I'm picking it back up again. Yeah. And you know what? This, I have to pay attention when I'm driving a stick. There's no time for texting and being on the phone. Your right hand's working, your left hand's on the steering wheel. You're not gonna be on your phone, right? While stick shifts accounted for 1.3% of sales in the U.S. in June, searches for new manual cars are up 13%. It's a bright spot in an otherwise downward trend. In 2000, more than 15% of new and used cars sold by CarMax were manual. By 2020, it was only 2.4%. Compare that to electric vehicles, which now make up 5% of car sales. Let's switch gears and have you show me how it's really done. Okay, yeah? let's do it. <laughs> but before we do, Ryan revs up the settings on the car. Ooh, you put it on some sort of race flag mode. We're gonna have some fun. I'm excited. You can't do worse than I did. I actually went off the track. Woo! Yeah, here we go. So what mode are we in right now? Woo! Super fun mode? Yeah, super fun mode. What do I smell? Is that rubber? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was like real life Fast and Furious, Ryan. Yeah, I don't recommend anyone doing that on Definitely. the roads. But we were here, we were safe, and I'm happy you had fun. Ford's manual transmission Bronco is also seeing a spike in interest. There's a lot more people ordering them, and you can definitely tell that they're getting, becoming more popular. Autumn Schwalbe is a future product planner for Ford's performance cars. She says aside from the fun of driving a stick, manuals can be cheaper too. On average, stick shifts cost nearly $1,800 less than automatics. What are your friends saying about manual transmission? I do know a lot of people that are super willing to learn at my age. As for me, I finished in victory lane. I didn't have to do much teaching, so I was, I'm just happy I just get to sit here and ride. Best journalist driver of the day? By far. <laughs> Your check will be in the mail later. <laughs> Up next, a mom creating diverse and inclusive dolls for everyone. On the heels of Barbie mania, there's renewed interest in dolls, and I recently met a mom on a mission to make playtime more inclusive. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. Barbie.
Barbie's blockbuster summer brought dolls back into the spotlight. And a look at what's for sale now reveals a slew of new toys, from dolls for boys and female action figures to Miniland's dolls representing children with Down syndrome and Mattel's fashionista line featuring a doll in a wheelchair. Even Lego spreading love to the LGBTQIA plus community with this Everyone is Awesome set. In a $40 billion industry, 50% of parents rank diversity and representation as a top consideration when toy shopping. I was just shocked by the fact that I couldn't find a single doll that I thought looked remotely like any Asian child I know. Eleanor Mack says last year, while shopping for a doll resembling her now three-year-old daughter, Jillian, she was disappointed. You only knew those dolls were Asian because they had a name like Ling, or they were holding a panda bear, or they had that really bad blunt haircut. Yeah! <laughs> American Girl produced Corinne Tan, a Chinese-American doll in 2022, in part to help kids deal with anti-Asian racism. But Mack says the doll's backstory highlights the Chinese father's lack of work during the pandemic. Her Chinese-American father is this struggling ski instructor in Aspen who effectively can't provide for the family. The mom gets a divorce, remarries a wealthy white guy named Arnie. Wow, I did not know the backstory of that doll. Your reaction is exactly how I felt. And it wasn't just the backstory. And when I looked at that doll, the big round eyes, the skin color, she just didn't look Asian. American Girl telling NBC News the Corinne backstory was written by an Asian American author and designers consulted with her and an anti-Asian racism expert, among others, on Corinne's hairstyle and color, skin tone, and a new eye sculpt to more authentically reflect her Chinese American heritage. The company adding the doll has received an overwhelmingly positive response from fans. I wanted our children to be proud of their Asian eyes, to know that they are beautiful. Mac decided to make the doll she wishes she had as a girl, working with other Asian American parents to design, develop, and source the materials. Just a year after coming up with the idea for an Asian American doll who loves to bake with her grandmother, Mac introduced the world to Jilly Bing. What was your daughter's reaction when she saw this doll for the first time? She just gasped and she's like, Jilly, she looks like me. You want to color in Jilly Bing? Mac eventually left her job in healthcare. Now her San Francisco home is Jilly Bing headquarters. How many dolls in this house right now? Three or 400. Um, we started out with close to 2,000. So she has a little chef's hat that flips over and becomes this little <laughs> who doesn't love an egg tart. Exactly. Jilly Bing becoming part of a trend of non-white dolls originating in the 1960s. We're seeing games, we're seeing puzzles. And it's really starting to broaden the horizon so that kids can go into a store and they're going to see toys that really reflect the real world that we all live in. James Zahn, senior editor at the Toy Insider, says consumer spending has convinced toy makers to invest the time and money it takes to develop more inclusive products. When kids are able to play with toys that look like themselves or look like their family, their friends, whoever they're seeing in the community, I think that it just sort of works with their own development in thinking of the world as a very diverse place. And when those toys step beyond stereotypes, they can have a lasting impact for generations. And that's our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential on Today All Day. For all of us here at NBC News, I'm Vicki Nguyen. With coastline that stretches for more than 60 miles, South Carolina's Grand Strand is home to some of America's most beautiful beaches. Here in Myrtle Beach, family-friendly activities, energetic nightlife, and natural attractions have made this place a tourist hotspot for decades. As a beach town, seafood's a real star of the show here. From crispy fried fish to creative daily specials, and of course, Carolina classics like shrimp and grits. I'm here to savor every last bite of this city's freshest catch. Let's dive in. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Fresh seafood has been a big draw to Myrtle Beach since the late 19th century, according to historian Becky Billingsley. 
they would have these huge nets out there on the beach that took like 20 people to grab the nets and pull them in. Then they had these little fish shacks set up on the beach where they could fry the fish. And so you could also get a fish dinner right there on the beach. Today, Myrtle Beach welcomes over 19 million tourists each year. And its food scene has evolved from simple beach shacks to more than 2,000 restaurants feeding all those hungry visitors. So even if fishing isn't your thing, there are plenty of ways to enjoy Carolina's freshest catch. Merle's Inlet is a charming fishing town just 25 minutes from downtown Myrtle Beach. This quaint area is actually known as the seafood capital of South Carolina. I'm at Seven Seas Market, a community favorite that's known for its impressive variety of local fish. Each day, the fishermen here are hauling in everything from shrimp to grouper, mahi-mahi, and more. Some might say it's shrimply the best. Hey, Al. Hey there. How you doing? Chris Conklin has been running this place for 15 years. We're able to source the finest fresh local seafood known to man with our own fishermen and our own boats. His son Christopher, already a seafood fan, often coming to help out. Bingo, I see who's going to be taking over the business. Seven Seas was founded by Chris's dad, Phil Conklin, in 1985. So this is a giant bluefin tuna. That, um, there's Phil, my dad. Phil was an engine man in the Navy, later becoming an avid sports fisher. After a visit to Merle's Inlet, he fell in love with the marsh's bountiful catch and was inspired by local markets that caught and sold their own seafood. We own six of our own boats now that fish for the snapper and grouper, and we have two shrimping boats as well. Merle's Inlet has a long history of commercial fishing. Until the mid 20th century, slaves and black Americans who harvested fish here were known as Creek Boys. Following the Civil War, it became a paying job for any skilled fisherman. And they were young men who would have several families that they caught seafood for. The area's unique geography lends itself to a wide variety of fish and shellfish. So that inlet in between the ocean and the land is an interesting mix of brackish and fresh water. And that's where we get our oysters and clams and crabs and really unique, fresh, not too salty, but just salty enough. Today, Merle's Inlet is a hotspot for nightlife with plenty of restaurants and bars, but few seafood markets remaining. Seven Seas is one of the last places still catching and selling its own fish. Hey fellas, what's going on? Hi, have a good trip? Indeed. Nice. For Chris, a passion for seafood started as a kid. At 12 years old, he got his first fishing boat on the weekends, catching flounder to sell at Seven Seas. He joined his dad full time after college. We were like best friends, you know, we work all day, sweat, blood, tears, whatever. In the early 2000s, Chris's best childhood friend Henry Ford joined the business. We did a bunch of hunting and fishing together. Chris is like a brother to me. Henry soon became like a member of the family. The trio worked together until Phil's passing in 2018. It was a big, a huge loss, but you just gotta pick your chin up and keep on. Henry taking on more responsibilities. Today, he's a co-owner at Seven Seas. So the art to a very good fish display is uh, to make them look like they're all swimming. The market offering up to a dozen local seafood options from red snapper, bluefin tuna, to grouper, flounder, oysters, and of course, shrimp. They also bring in seafood from all across the country. Under Chris, they've expanded beyond retail, supplying several fine dining establishments across the city. How about this good looking seafood we brought to you? Chris is proud carrying on his father's fishing legacy. A lot of customers, they hold us near and dear to their heart and they, they like to brag, so uh, I enjoy being people's seafood guy. Time to see the seafood guy in action. Seven Seas processing thousands of pounds of fish and shrimp daily. I helped unload the market's latest catch, South Carolina white shrimp. Take it right up there to the scale. All right, here we go. On a good week, how many pounds will you, you sell of these? Um, a thousand pounds a day in the summertime. A thousand yes, pounds a day? Just shrimp, yes sir. The shrimp gets covered in a layer of ice. The final step? A lesson from Chris and Henry 
in the fine art of cleaning and deheading shrimp. What we do is we take the shrimp up like this. Uh -huh. And every shrimp you touch, you have to pinch it. Uh -huh. Why? Right? To pinch the head off. Right? Oh, oh. The shrimp get organized into three sizes, medium, large, and extra large. What makes South Carolina shrimp special? They come from really clean water. We don't have a lot of mud, and they're much sweeter. Can you taste a shrimp and tell whether it's come from South Carolina or not? 100% I yeah. can, yes, sir. Wow. How about you, Henry? Yeah, absolutely. Coming up, I get a taste of South Carolina's famous shrimp. After prepping a mountain of shrimp at Seven Seas Market, I couldn't wait for a taste of this fresh catch. Co-owner Henry Ford whipping up a spread of local shellfish steamed to perfection with their house blend of spices. And I've even got some uh, stone crab claws Chris and I went and caught yesterday. Oh, this is red. Oh, do you ever get tired of seafood? Absolutely not. I could, not at all. I could eat seafood every day if I could. Seven Seas also sells several house-made specialties, many crafted by Henry, including a smoky fish dip and a Carolina favorite, she crab soup. What is she crab soup? It's crab meat, um, and it's a cream-based soup. Oh, wow. And we sell out of it every day. Woohoo! Oh, yes, sir. I can see why. Just being surrounded by seafood all day isn't enough for these two. They find time every week to hop on a boat and reel in a catch together. So when you guys, Henry, are out on the boat uh, fishing, what's it like? Oh man, it's, it's actually, after being at work all week, it's actually heaven on earth to get out there. Chris, how important is it to continue this legacy of, of South Carolina seafood? We're like the last of the Mohicans. You know, it's a lot easier to get seafood from other places, other countries. We go through all the trouble of having our own boats and trying to perpetuate what little bit is left of the South Carolina seafood industry. That's why we stay so busy. Well, I gotta tell you, this is some of the best shrimp I've ever had. Yep. Oh, man, this is great shrimp. Oh yeah, it's good. You know what, for all your hard work today, after this lovely meal we filled your belly, I wanna give that to you as a Ooh. gift from Chris and I, saying thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, yep. sir. You're part of the crew now. Al. All right. Aye, aye, Captain.
My definition of soul food is food that is made with love and care. My mom used to always tell me, son, don't never make anything or never sell anything that you wouldn't eat. So that's my definition of soul food. Word has it, if you're looking for some real soul food in Myrtle Beach, Big Mike's has the best soul food in town. Born and raised in Myrtle Beach, owner Mike Chestnut is a well-known member of this community, bringing people together with recipes from his mom's kitchen for over a decade. Just, just like from Mama's house. And I'm like, man, this is delicious. I can't think of any soul food restaurant that I go to that is better than this. Time to meet Big Mike. Nice Welcome to, to see Big Mike. Yes, Mike. sir. Good to I'm see you. Hey. All right. Yes, so sir. You guys all work here, right? Yes, yep. sir. Yep. From Big Mike to Little Lennox, Big Mike's soul food isn't just family owned. You got all family from top to bottom. My wife, Maxine, she worked here. And then also my oldest son, Michael, and my youngest son, Marcus, and my daughter, Michaela. It's the whole family. I mean, it's a family reunion. You know, a whole ball of wax. Yes, sir. <laughs> Mike Chestnut, AKA Big Mike, has spent his entire life in Little Beach, and he's become a well-known figure about town. He's always willing to give a hand to anybody who needs it, and he also takes pride in his work. Since I grew up here, I just want to feel like I'm giving back to the community. I serve as a deacon at our church and city councilman, involved in a lot of other organizations, whether it's the NAACP or American Culinary Federation. And then the restaurant, that's my, that's my true love, I'll be honest with you. Where'd your love of food come from? I would got to say it's from my mom. She could get in the kitchen at seven o'clock in the morning and just had fun at what she was doing. Big Mike's mom, Rosalie Chestnut, worked in many restaurants in the area as a cook. With her encouragement, her son's kitchen career began at just 12 years old as a dishwasher. But it didn't take long for his diligence and talent to shine through. The chef that was there, he just saw something in me, and I remember he went to the general manager and said, hey, I want Mike to come back and prep with me. Mike worked the line at a country-style restaurant while going to school for not one, but two culinary programs. For nearly 20 years, Mike rose in the kitchen ranks, but he always dreamed of owning his own business. Mike soon found the answer to his prayers in a familiar spot. We um, saw this building, it was ready, and time was right. The high school used to be in the shopping center across the street, and we would actually jump the fence and come over here and eat lunch and go back. But who would ever thought that 40 years later we'd end up buying the place? Sadly, Mike's mother passing away before she could see him fulfill his dream. What do you think she would think of this place? I think she would be proud of us to say you're trying to do something to keep the family together and mm -hmm. also provide a living and feed the family. What's the best advice you gave you? People always eat with their eyes. So if it looks good, it's going to be good. Uh, oh, man, does this look good. Sweet yams, mac and cheese, fried chicken, collard greens. Those are just a few of Big Mike's soul food specialties. Seafood basket, catfish with fries. Obviously, seafood is a big deal. Yes, sir. Here. Mm -hmm. What do you do seafood-wise? We do um, fried whiting, and then we do catfish. Serving up seafood is a sure way to catch diners' attention here in Myrtle Beach. Big Mike Soul Food carries on a culinary legacy that's steeped in history. The term soul food was coined in the 1960s as a source of pride for many African Americans. But the cooking tradition has evolved over centuries and continents. African Americans, when, when they were forced to live here, they had to do what they had to do. So they incorporated what we had here into the taste they had there, and they incorporated their master's taste too. So it all merged together to be a French, English, Scottish, Dutch, African American, Native American, melting pot of flavors. Soul food restaurants began popping up all over the United States as black Americans migrated from the rural South, many becoming integral to their local communities. Is it important to have a, a, a black owned oh, yeah. restaurant? No question. As no part question. of the, the food scene? Yes, sir. It, it lets the community know, hey, if Mike can do it, I can do it. Because I tell people, you know, I grew up in a little area outside the city called Race Path. A lot of drugs, a lot of crime, and who would ever thought that we would be able to open up a restaurant in the heart of Myrtle Beach. I couldn't wait to get into the heart of this restaurant, the kitchen. 
We're going to do a Big Mac special today, meat and three. A signature meal of the South, meat plus three, three sides that is, started popping up in urban diners in the early 1900s. We're going to do some fish, we're going to do some hush puppies and some coleslaw oh. and some mac and cheese. All right, let's All get right. started. All right, well, we're going to start with some um, hush puppies over here. Hush puppies made from cornmeal batter can be sweet or savory. We probably go through a couple hundred of them, and wow. we do them all by hand. Let them cook for a little minute. All right. And then we're going to come back over and do the fish. All right. Um, my fish is going in a, in a cornmeal batter, and we add a little bit of extra seasoning to this. That little special little thing? special season that we make up there. It's nice and light batter on it. Right. With our fish and first side in the fryers, Mike whips up some coleslaw. Okay. Starting with all the usual fixings cabbage, mayo, vinegar, but Big Mike has another secret ingredient up his sleeve. Some people don't put relish in it, but I put relish in mine. Relish? Oh, that's good. And the sweetness of the uh, relish. And that relish, I would have never thought of adding relish. And with our fish a golden brown, hush puppies fried to perfection, and coleslaw ready to serve, time for the third side, mac and cheese. Just how his mama made it. There we go, Ooh. Big Mike special. Oh, oh my gosh. Get a hidden spot. I mean, it's so light. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's not a heavily breaded fish. I'm a huge hush puppy. OK. Got, it's got this sweetness to it. Yes, sir. That is about as good as it gets. All right. Wow. Wow is right. I haven't had flaky fish like this since I was a kid back in St. Albans, Queens. I clean my plate, just like everybody else who walks through the doors here. I just want to leave something for my grandkids and kids to say, hey, this is a family thing and we want to keep it going. Just a stone's throw from the shore is Myrtle Beach's Arts and Innovation District. Winna's Kitchen is one of the newest restaurants in this part of town. Here, Chef Jess Sagan is delighting tourists and locals alike with her elevated brunch tables. She's also on a mission to give back to the community, extending a helping hand with warm meals to those in need. Hey, nice Al, to nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm oh, so glad to be here. And what's going on here? It seems like there's a lot of These cool are, kids hanging out here. They are. These are our grandchildren, my daughter Kenzie and her five kids. Now, you usually don't find kids studying at a restaurant, but here at Winna's Kitchen, owner Jess Sagan loves keeping her family close by. So close, in fact, that all five of her grandchildren are homeschooled right here in the basement. So there's always time for a bit of family fun. I'm on a rock right now. I'm on a base and I can't get down. I'm not into that. Jess's daughter, Kinsey, doesn't just teach here. She's also the co-owner and deeply invested in the heart and soul of this culinary adventure. I'm the brains and she's the brawn, but she's also the brains. I do a lot of the creative elements of the menu, but the day-to-day -day kitchen line 
restaurant is Kinsey. Even the name of the place is a nod to family. My mom's name was Linda. Her nickname was Winna. And when my mom passed away, she had a lot of regrets. And I knew that opening a restaurant was something that I would have a regret about if we didn't give it a shot. It was pursuing a dream, but also investing in a community that we believed in. At Winna's Kitchen, those facing homelessness are able to enjoy a meal totally free of charge. We say this all the time. We didn't open a 30-seat restaurant to make a lot of money. We opened a 30-seat restaurant to make an impact. And how do you do that? Our patrons can pay $5, and they'll either hang a card, it'll say number one, and we'll feed somebody for it, or they can take that card with them, and if they see somebody out on the street that they think needs it, they can give it to them. But our goal is to kind of restore dignity to people. They get to sit down at a table or the bar and be served. It's a calling that stems from her own journey. There was a point in your life where things were pretty tough. In my mid to late 20s, I, I took a leave of sanity, I say. I just checked out and I ended up making some really bad choices that led me into a place of addiction and ultimately homelessness. Then I ended up going to live at the rehab program for homeless people and I completed that program and 20, almost six years later, here we are. In rehab, Jess met her future husband, Walt, a volunteer from a local church program. Back on her feet, she devoted her professional life to her faith, serving as a worship pastor for two decades. What led you to opening up a restaurant? It is the food. We love to eat, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Jess and Kinsey got their start in the food world by catering benefits for a local nonprofit. After a string of successful dinners, they took the plunge, opening Winna's Kitchen in 2021. The first item on their menu, the free number one special. So what, what about for the folks who come in who need that meal? What, what's their reaction? The number one reaction we get is they are so hesitant to let us serve them. We often have people, they're like, hey, if, do you need help with the dishes? And I'm like, no, you're a patron. Jess doesn't stop at serving free meals. She's given many a second chance, employing people who have faced addiction or homelessness. Not a lot of restaurants give back to the community. How did that evolve? So there's this passage of scripture, and when you invite people uh, to your house for a meal, invite the lowly in. And um, I would say it's easy to do nice things for people who are gonna do nice things for you. But the real gift in the kingdom for us is is doing things for people who can't do anything for you. And showing up for people who can't show up back. And loving people who might not ever love you back or even appreciate you back. That's really investing in people. And that's who we want to be. I mean, it's, it's like, like dignity is on the menu. It is. Dignity is on the menu. Kinsey is just as passionate about her mother's mission. I'm so proud of my mom. You're doing great, sweetie. I love you. She has experienced such a hard life, and her attitude, her ability to overcome is just, I think most people would just lay down and give up, and she, it just drives her to do more and be more. She teaches her kids at Winners so they can learn from their grandma's compassion on a daily basis. She is nice to everyone, and she's independent at the same time. The legacy my mom will give us is not this building, it's how she taught us to treat each other, how she teaches us to interact with each other. In addition to helping others, Jess is also dedicated to highlighting seasonal, locally sourced ingredients. My grandparents were very farm to table, I mean, before farm to table was a thing. Uh -huh. Both my sets of grandparents had gardens that we ate off of all summer. We're in the South, there's a lot of fried chicken and a lot of French fries and a lot of fried everything. But my daughter and I both like food that's a little bit different, a little bit elevated. The mother-daughter duo putting their spin on brunch classics like fluffy ricotta pancakes with lemon curd and a deconstructed chicken pot pie. Oh man, that was the best dessert I've ever had. But there's one dish that's been a menu mainstay since the beginning. When it comes to Jess's take on this Southern classic, the sauce is the boss. What's the thing that makes your shrimp and grits so special? It's our sauce. It's kind of this 
mix between cream and tomato. And it's infused with some secret spices and some ham stock. Maybe you'd show me how this is done? I'd love to. When is shrimp and grits? Starts with, of course, the shrimp. We try to use large local shrimp. They're really sweet. They got the perfect amount of salt. Stock gives her signature sauce a richer flavor. How do you make your ham stock? We don't share all of our secrets ah, here. Ah, okay, all righty. Just then searing the shrimp in clarified butter, seasoning them with Kinsey's secret spice blend. It does have salt, pepper, garlic, a little bit of dill, and a little bit of something, something else something, in it. Something, something, a little and something, something. I'm not being coy. I don't no, know, no. I don't know what she put in. <laughs> and what's shrimp and grits without cheesy grits? Each batch made fresh every morning. Well, now, what kind of cheese is that? The main cheese in here is some coastal cheddar. The shrimp finished with a drizzle of buttery love. Then, time to plate it up. So we're going to let you help finish this off. All right. This is a little bit of uh, Parmesan that mm -hmm. we've just kind of chunked up. To top it off, cherry tomatoes and some microgreens. And, of course, the best part, tasting. That's fantastic, Jess. When you present something like this to the community, how much pride does this bring you and Kinsey? I think it's why we do what we do. You know, shrimp and grits is a very, really a humble dish. And we've just taken it and put a ton of care into it. When I was growing up, people would say, love is a secret ingredient. It's true. And so elevating food is not just about making it fancy. It's about taking the level of care to make it look a certain way. Yeah. And I think that adds to nourishing people not just with the food they eat but their spirit too well my spirit feels very good right now <laughs> mm. whether you're looking to kick back with casual beachy fare or enjoy elevated modern menus myrtle beach is a seafood lover's paradise the very best of South Carolina's most beloved dishes can all be found right here. And there's no doubt that the thriving restaurant community shapes the heart and soul of this vibrant coastal city. This episode of Family Style is sponsored by Visit Myrtle Beach. Welcome to The Boost. On today's show, we'll meet the stars behind a few viral TikTok videos. But let's get things started. We're going to take a look at a special club that's all about food, friendship, and paying it forward. It's better to give than to receive. That's what my mother taught me. The feeling you get is indescribable. Richard Brooks loves to dine in surprise with a group of friends who call themselves the Thousand Dollar Breakfast Club. The goal of the club is to make a server very happy with at least a thousand dollar tip. Currently a lawyer, Richard knows the difference a big tip can make. When I was in college, I was a waiter. My biggest tip ever was $20, and I remember it. I remember the person giving it to me. I remember the feeling I got. I don't know why they gave it to me. Maybe they just thought that I was a hardworking kid going to college. He would continue sharing that feeling by giving service workers $100 here and there. But it was his brother who inspired Richard earlier this year to take it to the next level. My brother called me from California and said, hey Richard, guess what I just did, what? I just went to this breakfast where everybody gives a $100 bill and they give the waiter or waitress a $1,000 tip. So he knew I would do it and by that night I had gotten 10 friends together and we started the club. After their first surprise in March. Well, this tip is for you, $1,400. Wow. The friends met every couple of months at various restaurants around Massachusetts. My favorite one so far was the surfer who said with a big smile on his face, my mother's been trying to buy a hearing aid for herself, so I'm going to go home today and buy her a hearing aid. And he did. The members of the club get as much from this as the restaurant workers do. It's nice to be able to do something like this and uh, just try and pay it forward. The way the world has been the last couple of years, the world needs more of this. So it's an honor to do this. My late son, Christopher, was in the business for many, many years, and I saw how hard he worked. So this breakfast club, it just warms my heart to see the reaction on the faces of those 
that are receiving this money. We really want this to spread and we want others around the country to understand that you don't have to be a celebrity or a millionaire to do something special to really make somebody's day. I'm a teacher. We just want people around the world to realize you can do this. Now that club is gaining attention and motivating others to do the same. We got the chance to join the $1,000 Breakfast Club as they head to Red's Kitchen and Tavern in Peabody, where Mimi Joyce has no idea what's in store for her. Hi, everyone. I'm Mimi. I'm going to be your server. Are you all set to order? Enjoy a little more coffee. After settling the bill, it's time for the big surprise. The only reason we're here is for you. Every single person in this room has given a hundred dollar tip. So oh my goodness. We have a big tip for you. This Thank is the fun you, everybody. Part. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, one, two. Oh my gosh. 13, oh my god. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 1900 dollars Thank you so much. Thank everybody. you so much. Thank you. We get wow. just as much pleasure as you do, believe it. It's so fun. I'm us. so happy right now. I feel like I just won a million bucks, really. Thank you oh, so a much. A single mom who's been working in restaurants for nearly 25 years. This experience, priceless. I plan to use this tip by paying off some bills and making sure my kids have everything that they ask for. And also to pay it forward by giving a nice tip to my servers. <laughs> My heart feels happy right now. I, I just feel like that was just so generous, and I feel really overwhelmed with gratitude. Can I give you a hug? Oh, uh, you can give me a hug, of course. Thank you so Enjoy much. Enjoy it. Now let's turn to complete strangers coming together and having kind conversations, all in the hopes of bridging a divide. Meet the founder of One Small Step. I am nervous, I am excited, I am coming into this with an open heart and an open mind. I am very excited to see how this turns out, what we have in common, and what differences we have and how that can still unite us. In Wichita, Kansas, strangers Lamisha Courtney and Brandi Hibbs are about to meet for the first time. This scheduled coming together of strangers is all part of the nonprofit One Small Step, which hosts and records 50-minute conversations between people with different political views. Prior to the conversation, Misha and Brandy were given each other's bios. I know she's a single mom, has three children. She is um, from a family of six, that she has children of her own, that her father was in the military. One Small Step founder Dave Isay is on a crusade to unify our country, one conversation at a time. You know, if we spent more time listening to each other and less time screaming at each other and hating each other, what a better and stronger country it would be. One Small Step uses contact theory psychology under the premise that it's hard to hate up close. Part of the secret sauce of One Small Step is that we don't talk about politics. This is just about two human beings looking each other in the eye and talking about what really matters to them. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> A facilitator handed them their first question. So Brandy, tell me about one or two people in your life who have had the biggest influence on you. A place they found common ground. I have to say my parents, hands down. They had me when they were super young. Um, and we're not prepared to be parents. I would say the exact same. Um, my parents were and still are some of the most important people to me. So when you were talking about your parents, like I was like, oh gosh, that's me too. They soon discovered differences on some hot button issues. I'm definitely more on the conservative side. I am very pro-life. My faith as being a Christian, definitely something that has molded me to who I am, but also shaped my beliefs. Certain segments of population say pro-life, but don't want to have gun laws in place that stop the lives of innocent children in schools being killed. Personally, you know, being an open carrier myself, um, I prefer that. I'd rather see it and know who's got it, but I still think there should be training that's involved 
um, in the handling of the weapons and the safety of the weapons and things like that. Misha shared her biggest fears as a mother. People talk about Black Lives Matter and, oh, we don't like them because they start. No, what we're trying to say is that we want our lives to matter just as much as anybody else's lives. I don't want to have to worry about my children walking the street and my neighborhood and never coming home. I worry when they go to the snow cone stand with their friends that don't look like them. And I just wish we lived in a world where I didn't have to worry about that. I wish I had the words to respond because honestly, um, and it's it's something that you know I've I've thought about, but I I don't understand it. If there's something I can do to increase my knowledge and learn more about your perspective, then I'm all for it. In the end, they found some common ground. Your desire to want to know more or saying, what can I do? That's the first step. Sure. Just, okay, being willing to, okay, I don't understand. How can I understand or what can I, who can I talk to? What can I learn? And so even said, a new friendship. <laughs> I've found a, a friend um, with Misha. Um, and, and I'd love to be able to keep in touch. So I didn't come looking for a friend, but I think I found one. Every interview ends the same way. It almost belies belief. You know, it decreases fear of the other and, and it allows us to see the human being and the American sitting across from us. Coming up, a remarkable woman fighting ALS with a lot of humor and heart right after this. on the boost with a story about a remarkable young woman who's finding light in the darkness. Diagnosed with ALS, she is determined to show the world what it's really like to live with an incurable disease. And she's doing it with heart, humor, and amazing grace. If you had to describe 34-year-old Brooke Eby's love language, it would probably be laughter. Brooke, you are the most cheerful person I can imagine who has such a serious diagnosis. What gives you that joie de vivre, this joy? <sighs> Levity is my superpower, and it's really how I'm bringing my story to the world. I'm trying to use humor and really let ALS be heard. At the young age of 29, Brooke began experiencing weakness in her legs. It took doctors three years to diagnose her with ALS, a rapidly progressing neurodegenerative disease. It's a devastating diagnosis, and there are no survivors. Thank you. Today we're seeing my neurologist. It's not really an appointment I think any ALS patient looks forward to, mostly because you're always getting worse. I am seeing that you're weaker in your right leg. Was there a moment when you finally got that diagnosis where you didn't have that positive attitude? I mean, you'd be very human yeah. if your heart was broken. I remember crawling into bed with like a bag of M&Ms, party size, and just two to three months of blink from there. It was just survival. I heard there was a turnaround at a wedding yeah. when you were a bridesmaid. Yes, one of my best friends was getting married and I was in the wedding, which, 
you can't hide when you're a bridesmaid. And a couple of my friends were like, why don't we just try to make it really fun? And a couple hours later, we had the bride limboing under my walker. I was giving people walker rides all over the dance floor. Brooke realized if she could get people smiling and laughing, maybe they would hear what she had to say, too. She soon started posting on social media about her ALS journey in her way. Today, we are driving to go borrow my first wheelchair. The pharmacist spent 10 minutes telling me how bad this tastes. I think. People are so scared to talk about a terminal diagnosis and death and what that looks like in a young person. But if you see yourself in me and you're able to laugh with me, then hopefully people are taking away more about ALS. Brooke's posts have since had millions of views. Her series on dating with ALS has been a fan favorite. You did one Instagram post about dating and telling your would-be suitors that you have a cane. Mm -hmm. What were your pickup lines? Dating me is like getting to cut the lines at Disney World. <laughs> She's a 10, but she needs a lot of pick-me-up. <laughs> I'm just a girl standing in front of a boy asking him to hold her upright. <laughs> Can you read some of the responses? Because there were some very good ones. I was impressed. Mm -hmm. OK, I see you, Abraham Limpin. <laughs> I feel like we're in the Bible because you're Cain and I'm Abel. <laughs> That's a winner right there. That was a winner. <laughs> if only laughter really were the best medicine, because for ALS, there are very few options. You get diagnosed, they tell you two to five years. Here are three medications that might help you out for a couple of months, and we'll just follow you from there. Which makes the sparkle in Brooke's eyes all the more astonishing. If people know anything about ALS, they think about that ALS ice bucket challenge a few years back. Everyone was doing it, mm -hmm. and people might think they must not need any money at all. Yeah. The ice bucket challenge was a really great step because it helped fund one medication. We still don't have a cure. So the disease, I would still say, is very underfunded. I know being introspective isn't your favorite thing, but something like this must teach you so much. So much. When you picture your future, you kind of picture like a runway. You can picture, you know, travel or career, or growing your family. When I got diagnosed, the future, that runway was just cut off. Like the future no longer exists for me. And that's a heavy thing, but not everything that's changed has been super sad and so I think I'm aware of more of the beauty and kindness in the world now than I was. A new sense. A sixth sense. A sixth sense. I'm, I'm a sixth sense. <laughs> <laughs> I see nice people. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed looking at my... And Brooke plans on using her voice even after this disease takes it from her. Yes. So what would you want to tell people? Well, you still can. There are two things that I would ask of people to do. ALS research needs money, so find the ALS organization that speaks to you and give, donate. And then two is follow my story. I think we associate ALS with characters who don't look like me. So I want people on this journey with me and know that we're gonna laugh along the way, but don't look away. This next man describes himself as a glass half full kind of guy, a mindset that's helped him overcome some enormous challenges and create a beautiful life. Take a look. Francesco Clark is living a life he could have never imagined. I'm lucky. Mm. I really just feel like I'm living a dream. I love that you just said, I'm lucky, and yet you've lived through some pretty hard things. I think life is best acknowledged through the perspective that you look, whatever lens you look through. Yeah. 21 years ago, when Francesco dove into a pool, his life changed forever. Talk to me a little bit about that day. I was 24 years old. I was working in fashion. I was working at Harper's Bazaar, just got promoted. And I felt like I was unstoppable. I dove in thinking it was a deep end. I was paralyzed in the blink of an eye. I became a shadow of myself for three years after I had to redefine my life in a wheelchair. 
and not being able to get up and get a glass of water at midnight when you're thirsty or, or go out with your friends when you want to. I felt like an infant. I couldn't look in a mirror. I couldn't be in a room. Because what would you see when you looked in a mirror? All I would notice was a wheelchair and I would burst into tears. I realized that a secondary effect of my injury was that my skin stopped sweating. So I developed rosacea, eczema, and a hypersensitivity to ingredients that every other skincare line uses that made my skin look older. So when I looked in the mirror, it wasn't me. And I felt betrayed by my reflection. Francesco's father was a medical doctor, also trained in homeopathy, and helped his son come up with a unique formula to help his skin. Clark's Botanicals never was a business plan. It was something that I started from a hospital bed to empower myself. It was a psychological and emotional recovery. So how did Clark's help heal you? It helped me connect. It helped me feel like a human being again. Friends and family started to notice the improvement in Francesco's skin, and they wanted in. In 2008, Francesco's personal project bloomed into a business, and today he is CEO of an award-winning global brand. I can't help but think about how much hope and resilience there is in your story, and probably what hard work it took to find that hope. You have to wake up every morning and work at it. Email Raymond. It doesn't just happen. But I don't live in a dream that every day is a good day. But you deal with them. And you work through them. Francesco's life has become even more full. He found love with partner Alberto Mahelcic Banzana and with the help of a surrogate, welcomed twins this past June. Now we have two giggly, chubby, babies that really center me <laughs> and make me feel more determined and make me feel calm. <gasps> Our little miracles. <laughs> Look at his smile. Francesco and his family have written their own script and it's a beautiful one. Does this feel like when you have the, these babes in your arms that your family's complete? Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is our unit, and this is our purpose. My sense of self is no longer about me, and my existence now encompasses so much more. For me, my spinal cord injury was something that happened, but my life could have ended, mm -hmm. and I could have become a memory of somebody who could have been, instead of somebody who now is. Still ahead, the stay-at-home mom who's turned into a TikTok sensation. We will introduce you to her right after this.
Welcome back to The Boost. Today we're spotlighting a woman who found her true calling a little later in life when she decided to make a dramatic turn and try her hand at comedy. Here's her story. A few years ago, Zarna Gar got an unexpected gift. So how many messages in total came in? I think 140 something. Messages written by friends and family, compiled by her daughter, Zoya. These notes were the final push she needed to try professional comedy. I wept on how much time my daughter spent doing this when she should have been studying for the SATs. <laughs> Growing up in India, Zarna didn't even know what a comedian was. The youngest of four, she was just 14 when her mom passed away. It was a very sudden situation. And my dad, I think her death broke him in some way. So he just decided the next day, he's like, you need to get married. He had no school <laughs> hopes for you, no job no. hopes, just get married? No, and you know, he was not a bad guy. I, like, I didn't hold it against him then, nor do I now. But Zarna had other plans. She decided to move to America and become a lawyer. She got married, started a family, and became a full-time mom. Yeah, three kids, but I was dying inside dying. I really wanted to get back to work. I couldn't figure out a way out. It was very complicated. Her way out was right in front of her. For years, she'd been entertaining family and friends. If you are good, you will get to see Delhi. <laughs> Quietly perfecting her act. And my daughter is like, mom, people like do this for a living. I'm like, no, they don't. What are you talking about? And then my kids ganged up on me. Her kids convinced her to start performing at open mics around New York City. I'm an immigrant, you guys. I came to America with $9 in my pocket. 10000 in the bank, but 9 in the pocket. <laughs> Indian people only wrote the ultimate book on sex. To which she responded, we wrote Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> During the pandemic, they also got her to post videos on social media, where more than 200 million have laughed right along with her. Okay, can we please focus? Focus is not a word. It is a word. It is plural of focus is focus. Now, Hillary Clinton and Kevin Hart have cast Zarna on their shows. She's even got her own comedy special in the works. I think what I find so interesting about your story is how much of it was you taking the reins. Oh, but how else is it going to happen? All because she took comedy seriously. For today, Vanita Nair, NBC News, New York. You've been great. Now to the story of a bond between a barber and one of his young clients. Let's see how these two ended up with a viral video that's now been viewed by millions of people. The slang term for a haircut is getting your ears lowered. You want to say hi to everybody? Hi. Hi. But this one will get your spirits raised. Hey, That's seven-year-old Ellison Eubanks <laughs> laughing in the barber chair, a sight his mom Julie never thought she'd see. You see, for Ellison, who has Down syndrome, haircuts were once on par with root canals. They were sensory overload. I felt like we would leave every appointment kind of, you know, traumatized and he would have even more of a negative view of a haircut than he did before. Then they met Vernon Jackson. You did an awesome job, man. I'm so proud of you. Who just seemed to have the right touch. It's something about Vernon's energy is really cool. Ellison just gravitated towards him right away and he treated him like a human being, like any other client. A couple years ago, Vernon created the Gifted event. Using money donated by the community, he gives free haircuts to kids with special needs, to those who may otherwise feel marginalized. I'm someone like, no, I see you, and I want to address you as you may have seen. I'm here with you through the process. During his second haircut with Vernon in January, Ellison, who's known as a bit of a class clown, suddenly decided to play a game. <laughs> of stop and go. and go, bringing sheer joy. And go. Go. Video of this moment has been watched on TikTok more than three million times. The people that are viewing this video are being healed from their perspective and their stigma and having a little more patience with the children. A valuable <laughs> lesson that thanks to Vernon and Ellison and is getting the green light. You can say go. 
It's like their BFF now, you know, like he loves going there. He walks in and he gives him a hug and he knows to sit in the chair and he knows that it's a safe place. Hey, we finished. <laughs> After the break, we got another uplifting story for you. You do not want to miss it. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Boost. We couldn't leave you without one more feel-good story. Check it out. It was guaranteed to be a memorable moment, so a man was proposing to his longtime girlfriend on the beach. The young uh, couple's daughter was there to be part of the occasion, but things didn't always go as, as planned. So the man first asked the daughter, is it okay if I ask mommy a question? No. She said no. And then moments <laughs> later, mommy put the girl down. After she took a few steps, guess what? She spotted the camera. So she did what any toddler would oh, do, go right up to it. Oh, wait. This, of course, while the whole proposal is happening. <laughs> Romantic proposal on in the background. Um, yeah. <laughs> she said yes. Um, <laughs> oh, that's that's it, framed sir. perfectly. That's great. It's actually oh, perfect. By the way, they're in hysterics. I love it. Uh, anyway, there you go. Great. Isn't that a good one? That is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining us here on The Boost, and we hope you are feeling the power of positivity after today's show, and we'll see you back here tomorrow on Today All Day. And thanks for joining us on Consumer Confidential here on Today All Day. I'm Vicki Wynn. We're back with more insider tips and the latest consumer news. From warnings about knockoff weight loss drugs to what you should consider before buying pet insurance. It's all coming your way. But first, a look at new technology that aims to make school buses safer for students. This is video from a school bus in North Carolina. Watch as the students on the left attempt to cross the road to board the bus, but then are nearly run over. And this Ohio bus driver hailed as a hero after saving a student from being hit by that car. These incidents are known as stop arm violations. A new survey estimates this happens more than 43 million times every year. These stop arm violations can have deadly consequences. According to a government report, 13 year old Evelyn Gurney was run over and killed by a driver in Wisconsin as she prepared to board her bus. The report stated the stop arm was deployed when the driver swerved around it and struck her. But new technology aims to make it safer for students by enabling buses to communicate directly with cars. I'm here in Indiana at the test track for IC Bus. It's the nation's largest bus manufacturer, and I'm going to show you for the first time how it all works. It's called Cellular Vehicle to Everything, or CV2X for short, and it's being developed by dozens of automakers and tech companies, including Audi and IC Bus. It just takes safety to the next level. With me is Justina Morrison from IC Bus. The bus driver slows down and extends the stop sign. Heading toward us is a car also outfitted with CV2X technology. 
That screen alerts the bus driver of the approaching vehicle. Near my vehicle in motion. As the car gets closer, the technology senses it has not slowed down, once again warning the bus driver, don't let kids off that bus. High speed vehicle approaching. What is that screen telling the bus driver right now? It's telling the bus driver how fast the car is approaching, how close the car is to the school bus, as well as from what direction that car is approaching the bus. So we saw how this tech works on buses, but what about for drivers of other cars who really need to know where those kids are? With me is Palm Mohotra from Audi to talk about what the experience is like behind the wheel. Palm, how will this prevent crashes? So the technology that we have in the Audi e-tron actually communicates directly with the school bus up to 10 times a second. And it doesn't matter if the driver in the vehicle is actually able to see the other vehicle hmm. or not because it can look around corners, it can sense a vehicle through an obstruction like another vehicle. And this is how we prevent accidents on the road and save lives. Let's see how it works. This time the bus is stopped, but I can't see it because it's hidden from view by that semi-truck. As I approach, I get a warning on my dashboard. Wow, so Palm, I don't even see a bus or any stop signs, but already the car is telling me something's ahead. Exactly, and it's telling you heads up, you need to slow down. Okay, let's see what happens when I don't slow down. And there's the warning. It gives me an extra time to react, and that can be the difference between life and death. Absolutely. We try it again, now with the semi-truck behind the bus as I maneuver to pass it. This is a very real scenario. A big rig slowed down in front of me, I don't see anything, so I'm just gonna change lanes around it, but. I'm already getting an indication. There's a school bus. Now I'm getting the stop indication. And if I don't stop, there's that alert. And I had plenty of time to stop. And CV2X isn't limited to buses and cars. It can be used to alert drivers to approaching emergency vehicles, upcoming construction zones, bicycles, even pedestrians, as long as they're equipped with the cellular technology but the safety benefit that it delivers on the road is incredible. Incredible safety when everything on the road can communicate so we can avoid scenes like this. The technology is not exclusive to Audi or Navistar. Nearly every automaker is working to get this into their vehicles as quickly as possible. Audi says they're hoping it will be standard technology in their vehicles within three to five years. Now, if you think that's a long time, the FCC actually set aside the bandwidth to make this all possible all the way back in 1999. Next, drugs like Ozempic are being used for weight loss, and recently, more websites have been selling knockoff versions. But are they safe? These days, it seems like everyone is looking to shed a few pounds. Baby, the hype is real. But as the craze for using diabetes drugs for weight loss grows, so too is the emerging market to get so-called knockoff versions of these popular medications, all without a prescription. A new report by the Wall Street Journal found more than 50 websites selling semaglutide and terzepatide, the active ingredients in diabetes drugs like Ozempic and Manjaro. Anytime demand vastly outstrips supply, entrepreneurs will step into the breach. While nearly all of the websites have disclaimers that the ingredients are not for human consumption, the journal found some had instructions for how people could use the substances on their own. They're not verifying who you are, and they do things like prefer to be paid in Bitcoin. The paper also says at least 18 of the sites have run ads on Instagram and Facebook in recent months, including ones like these from SAF Research, offering huge gains and a buy one, get two free deal on their vials of semaglutide. Facebook and Instagram's parent company Meta says they've removed ads for the sites on their platforms after being flagged by the journal telling NBC News in a statement reading in part, our policies prohibit the advertisement of prescription drugs without the proper authorization and approval. On its website, SAF Research offers numerous disclaimers stressing their products are not dietary supplements, but instead research chemicals for laboratory use only. But some are choosing to ignore these kinds of warnings. Across the websites they reviewed, the journal found that a month's supply of the ingredients cost around $100 to $200, compared to brand name drugs like Ozempic, which can cost around $1,000 a month without insurance. Lori Sicatello says she was prescribed Ozempic for her type 2 diabetes last year. Months later, she hit an insurance coverage gap, making it too expensive for her. They said now it's going to be $754. So she began taking research-grade semaglutide that her friend found online for about $100 a month. What's really in this? What am I, what am I taking here? By the end of the month, I wasn't comfortable with taking it anymore. 
The FDA is now sounding the alarm about the potential dangers of buying these ingredients online, saying in a statement that they advise consumers to not purchase peptides marketed as sold for research use and mix, ingest, or inject them. There are no FDA-approved generic versions of these substances, and drug makers Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly say they don't supply their ingredients to companies selling research substances. Earlier this year, our NBC News investigation found more than a dozen telehealth websites advertising Ozempic for weight loss. I experienced firsthand just how easy it was to get these medications online at a low cost. Admit my request. I had my Ozempic prescription by the very next day. My producer also got a prescription. This is Jamie. No one ever saw us on video or in person, and neither of us has diabetes or would be medically defined as obese. While it may seem like it's becoming easier than ever to get your hands on these drugs, experts say doing so comes at your own risk. I really advise patients to steer clear of the online versions because we just can't control the quality or the safety in those cases. The Wall Street Journal tells us some of the websites they contacted have already been taken down. We reached out to SAF Research for additional comment. We have not heard back. The website says they use different marketing tools to reach their audience and that none of their ads make claims that could send the wrong message about their products. SAF also emphasizes they do not sell supplements or medications. With so many counterfeit options, Novo Nordisk actually launched a website, semaglutide.com, to help people spot the difference between what's real and what's fake. Coming up, is pet insurance really worth it? How to decide if it's right for you. Plus, tips to help college students eat healthier on a budget. Welcome back, Americans. We love our pets, and more owners are now getting pet insurance. But it can be confusing to figure out if it makes sense for you. We help break it down. We love our pets like family. An estimated 111 million American households have a dog or cat. And just like any member of the family, health care is important, but an emergency vet visit can cost between $250 to $1,600. It's prompted a booming business in the U.S., pet insurance. The number of policies purchased at the end of last year has risen nearly 93% since 2019. It's another kid. You know, I have three daughters and I have Lucy. You got her as a puppy and immediately you thought, this is a good idea to have insurance for our pet. Why? Well, just like you would insure your children. You want to make sure, you know, if something bad happens that they're protected. Jeff Foos purchased a policy from True Panion, among the nation's largest pet insurance companies. He says his coverage started at $33 a month for Lucy. But after nine years, the cost has risen to almost $80 a month. That's a 141% increase. Foos says in some years, his rate increased more than the 20% his policy said it would never exceed annually. Do you think this was a worthwhile investment? Absolutely not. It can be hard to tell if pet insurance is worth it for you. We requested quotes from five popular companies using Bruno, a three-year-old mixed breed dog. For similar coverage and a deductible between two to $500, take a look at the rates. Embrace at the low end at $41 a month, 
Trupanion the highest at $167. None covers routine exams. We would absolutely recommend that you get your insurance when you have a puppy or kitten because that's when a pet doesn't have any pre-existing conditions. Margie Tooth is the president of Trupanion. The company brought in almost a billion dollars in revenue last year and says it's paid two billion in claims since the company was founded in 2000. We asked her about Jeff Foose's case and other complaints that Trupanion has raised its premiums to unaffordable levels that are far higher than vet care inflation. You said it's important to your company not to make consumers feel like it's a bait and switch, and yet we have talked to some who feel like they're not getting what they were promised. How do you respond to those criticisms? It's very disappointing to hear that people feel that way. I think we, we work very hard to ensure that we're explaining our value proposition and that we make it clear to people when they sign up with us that your price may change. Do you think there's enough regulation to make this industry uh, transparent and to help consumers really understand the pricing models? I do not. I think it's changing. I think it needs to continue to change more. It's a bad financial product. Kevin Brassler is executive editor for Consumers Checkbook, a nonprofit providing price research and consumer advice. In the case of pet insurance, we found that overall, compared to the payouts and the premiums you have to pay and all the other out-of-pocket expenses, they're generally really bad deals for most pet owners. Do you think it's a better idea to set aside some money in a rainy day fund rather than paying these premiums? Yeah, I mean, you're going to do far better off financially in the long run by taking those premiums that you'd pay to pet insurance companies and just saving them and taking care of your pet's costs out of pocket. If you want to buy pet insurance, Brassler says check accident-only policies to cover emergencies like car accidents or poisoning and look for a higher deductible plan to lower your monthly payments. Foose says he would have been better off with a rainy day fund. If you had just paid out of pocket for Lucy's incidents, mm -hmm. would you be ahead? I'd be ahead of about $2,300, $2,400. We reached out to Embrace. They told us their policies provide peace of mind and like insurance for homes, cars, and people, pets should be protected too. Up next, healthy and budget-friendly meal ideas for college students. And later, I'll look at what's fueling the growth in popularity of stick shifts. Consumer Confidential continues after this break. Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. College students, they're not making the grade when it comes to healthy eating. So I hit the grocery aisles with a chef who specializes in healthy and budget-friendly meals. 
fact, with nearly 3 million freshmen expected to attend college this fall, many students will live on their own for the very first time. A fresh taste of freedom served with a full plate of new responsibilities. Gail Cresci, a registered dietitian at Cleveland Clinic Children's, says as first-year students adapt to college life, some may struggle to maintain a healthy diet, a time I remember all too well. It was a lot of pizza, it was a lot of cookies, it was a lot of eating late at night, and a lot of contributing factors to the so-called freshman 15. Where are some areas that calories like to hide and sneak into a first-year student's diet? We find hidden calories in things like alcohol. Another area is with coffee. You may get some of those extra syrup flavorings, a whipped cream that's on those coffees. We see a lot of extra calories with fast food. What are three things you might advise a first year student when it comes to eating healthy? Avoid eating late at night if at all possible. And you're going to be hungry during the day, so have some healthy snacks available that are quick grab and go. Another thing is to make sure you're drinking adequate water. Crashy also recommends eating 20 to 30 grams of protein at each meal, which equals about three ounces of chicken breast or lean beef. This is where you live okay. when you're in college. We've called on chef, TV personality, and senior food editor for Budget Bites, Monte Carlo. Monty, class is in session. Yes. Clearly we got the assignment. You're Kale University. Okay, School of Hard Knocks. Yes, I'm representing University of San Francisco. So you say that when kids are off on their own for the first time, mm -hmm. often cooking on a budget, you gotta start with an A-plus grocery list. You have to start with an A-plus grocery list. And the best part is it's a really cheesy, easy one. Let's go. Let's start with fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay. It's important to eat nutritiously, yes. but this stuff is expensive and it doesn't always last a long time. No, it doesn't. This has the life of like a Disney star, what, like 24 hours? But the best deal for you when you want berries in your life is to go frozen. These fresh blueberries cost about five bucks a pound, but for the same price, you can buy three times that amount frozen, adding them to oatmeal, yogurt, or smoothies. Let's talk about packaged produce. Yes. What's your tip here? Do not do it. It's a no-no? No, come on, you're gonna pay like five dollars for poor little pieces of corn when you could buy this for 59 cents a pop, right? Ah. Just peel it, bro, it's not that hard. And right. if you have a microwave, you have fabulous fresh corn. Carlo, who teaches college cooking classes, says when it comes to appliances, every dorm room or apartment also needs a coffee pot. You can use it to make soups, you can use it to make eggs, anything that you would stew or heat up in a pot, you can make in a coffee pot. The next part of our lesson, a study of hot deals on frozen meals. A staple of college life is pizza. pizza. But you don't want to be dialing that pizza delivery company. No. One pepperoni pizza is $17. You can get three for $10. Carlos suggests stocking up on a variety of store brand frozen vegetables to use as pizza toppings. It's starting to feel kind of gourmet. Okay. Or as a way to help another college classic earn some extra credit. Are you ready for the pop quiz? I guess so. Which country consumes the most ramen per person per year? USA? Uh, no! Vietnam! Yeah! We love our ramen. Costing three bucks for six servings, Carlo partially cooks the noodles and divides them into mason jars with the veggies. When you're ready to eat, you add a little water, a little broth, you put it in the microwave, and you're set. So you just pre-make these ramen jars? Yes using your noodle to find a cart full of savings. Winning. Class dismissed. Ah! For other budget-friendly tips, consider shopping store brands and downloading the store's app for extra savings. Also, shop the less popular cuts of meat, like chicken thighs or sirloin tip steaks, and add beans to meat dishes for more bulk and protein. Now, let's switch gears to the recent growth in popularity of stick shifts. I hadn't driven a stick in nearly 20 years, so we found the best instructor to rev up my skills, a NASCAR champion. Drift, slide, side to side. But before we get into my skills behind the wheel, let's revisit that time in 2019. When Dylan and Al taught Craig and Chanel how to drive with a manual transmission. I didn't even feel you change it. Because I'm that good. As for me in 2023, you decide. Let's take it for a spin. All right, all right, so that's not exactly how it went, but I was in for some fun. 
Today we're outside City Field here in Queens, New York, and this this is the brand new Mustang Dark Horse. It is a manual transmission car. I can't wait to take it for a spin. Problem is, the last time I drove a stick was 15 years ago. But lucky for me, look who we have here, NASCAR Hi. driver, Coca-Cola 600 champion, Ryan Blaney. Hi, thank you so much you? for being here. Yeah. So there is a rise in interest in these manual transmission cars. What's the appeal, Ryan? I feel like the appeal of manuals is it kind of makes the driver feel one with the car. You're engaged. It, yeah, that's a great word. It makes you very engaged with the car. So I'm really excited to show you around it. Okay, so you'll stay with me as I kind of like go oh, yeah. through the bumps? I got you. <laughs> All right, let's do it. All right. I'm the first TV journalist to drive the dark horse. I know, tough assignment. What is the first thing I should be thinking about? So first thing is left foot in on the clutch. Okay. As you're letting your left foot off the clutch, and you know, your right foot's going down to the gas, and it's like got an even motion. So a lot of people kind of dump the clutch, and that's when you get like the big herky jerky. Did you bring a bar bag? Yeah. There we go. All right, all right. You know, it's like riding the bike. I'm picking it back up again. Yeah. And you know what? This, I have to pay attention when I'm driving a stick. There's no time for texting and being on the phone. Your right hand's working, your left hand's on the steering wheel. You're not gonna be on your phone, right? While stick shifts accounted for 1.3% of sales in the U.S. in June, searches for new manual cars are up 13%. It's a bright spot in an otherwise downward trend. In 2000, more than 15% of new and used cars sold by CarMax were manual. By 2020, it was only 2.4%. Compare that to electric vehicles, which now make up 5% of car sales. Let's switch gears and have you show me how it's really done. Okay, yeah? let's do it. <laughs> but before we do, Ryan revs up the settings on the car. Ooh, you put it on some sort of race flag mode. We're gonna have some fun. I'm excited. You can't do worse than I did. I actually went off the track. Woo! Yeah, here we go. So what mode are we in right now? Woo! Super fun mode? Yeah, super fun mode. <laughs> what do I smell? Is that rubber? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That was like real life Fast and Furious, Ryan. Yeah, I don't recommend anyone doing that on Definitely. the roads. But we were here, we were safe, and I'm happy you had fun. Ford's manual transmission Bronco is also seeing a spike in interest. There's a lot more people ordering them, and you can definitely tell that they're getting becoming more popular. Autumn Schwalbe is a future product planner for Ford's performance cars. She says aside from the fun of driving a stick, manuals can be cheaper too. On average, stick shifts cost nearly $1,800 less than automatics. What are your friends saying about manual transmission? I do know a lot of people that are super willing to learn at my age. As for me, I finished in victory lane. I didn't have to do much teaching, so I was, I'm just happy I just get to sit here and ride. Best journalist driver of the day? By far. <laughs> Your check will be in the mail later. <laughs> Up next, a mom creating diverse and inclusive dolls for everyone. On the heels of Barbie mania, there's renewed interest in dolls. And I recently met a mom on a mission to make playtime more inclusive. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. Barbie.
Barbie's blockbuster summer brought dolls back into the spotlight. And a look at what's for sale now reveals a slew of new toys, from dolls for boys and female action figures to Miniland's dolls representing children with Down syndrome and Mattel's fashionista line featuring a doll in a wheelchair. Even Lego spreading love to the LGBTQIA community with this Everyone is Awesome set. In a $40 billion industry, 50% of parents rank diversity and representation as a top consideration when toy shopping. I was just shocked by the fact that I couldn't find a single doll that I thought looked remotely like any Asian child I know. Eleanor Mack says last year, while shopping for a doll resembling her now three-year-old daughter, Jillian, she was disappointed. You only knew those dolls were Asian because they had a name like Ling, or they were holding a panda bear, or they had that really bad blunt haircut. Yeah! <laughs> American Girl produced Corinne Tan, a Chinese-American doll in 2022, in part to help kids deal with anti-Asian racism. But Max says the doll's backstory highlights the Chinese father's lack of work during the pandemic. Her Chinese-American father is this struggling ski instructor in Aspen who effectively can't provide for the family. The mom gets a divorce, remarries a wealthy white guy named Arnie. Wow, I did not know the backstory of that doll. Your reaction is exactly how I felt. And it wasn't just the backstory. And when I looked at that doll, the big round eyes, the skin color, she just didn't look Asian. American Girl telling NBC News the Corinne backstory was written by an Asian American author and designers consulted with her and an anti-Asian racism expert, among others, on Corinne's hairstyle and color, skin tone, and a new eye sculpt to more authentically reflect her Chinese American heritage. The company adding the doll has received an overwhelmingly positive response from fans. I wanted our children to be proud of their Asian eyes, to know that they are beautiful. Mac decided to make the doll she wishes she had as a girl, working with other Asian American parents to design, develop, and source the materials. Just a year after coming up with the idea for an Asian American doll who loves to bake with her grandmother, Mac introduced the world to Jilly Bing. What was your daughter's reaction when she saw this doll for the first time? She just gasped and she's like, Jilly, she looks like me. You want to color in Jilly Bing? Mac eventually left her job in healthcare. Now her San Francisco home is Jilly Bing headquarters. How many dolls in this house right now? Three or 400. Um, we started out with close to 2,000. So she has a little chef's hat that flips over and becomes this little who doesn't love an egg tart. Exactly. Jilly Bing becoming part of a trend of non-white dolls originating in the 1960s. We're seeing games, we're seeing puzzles. And it's really starting to broaden the horizon so that kids can go into a store and they're gonna see toys that really reflect the real world that we all live in. James Zahn, senior editor at the Toy Insider, says consumer spending has convinced toy makers to invest the time and money it takes to develop more inclusive products. When kids are able to play with toys that look like themselves or look like their family, their friends, whoever they're seeing in the community, I think that it just sort of works with their own development in thinking of the world as a very diverse place. And when those toys step beyond stereotypes, they can have a lasting impact for generations. And that's our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential on Today All Day. For all of us here at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. With coastline that stretches for more than 60 miles, South Carolina's Grand Strand is home to some of America's most beautiful beaches. Here in Myrtle Beach, family-friendly activities, energetic nightlife, and natural attractions have made this place a tourist hotspot for decades. As a beach town, seafood's a real star of the show here. From crispy fried fish to creative daily specials, and of course, Carolina classics like shrimp and grits. I'm here to savor every last bite of this city's freshest catch. Let's dive in. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Fresh seafood has been a big draw to Myrtle Beach since the late 19th century, according to historian Becky Billingsley. 
they would have these huge nets out there on the beach that took like 20 people to grab the nets and pull them in. Then they had these little fish shacks set up on the beach where they could fry the fish. And so you could also get a fish dinner right there on the beach. Today, Myrtle Beach welcomes over 19 million tourists each year. And its food scene has evolved from simple beach shacks to more than 2,000 restaurants feeding all those hungry visitors. So even if fishing isn't your thing, there are plenty of ways to enjoy Carolina's freshest catch. Merle's Inlet is a charming fishing town just 25 minutes from downtown Myrtle Beach. This quaint area is actually known as the seafood capital of South Carolina. I'm at Seven Seas Market, a community favorite that's known for its impressive variety of local fish. Each day, the fishermen here are hauling in everything from shrimp to grouper, mahi-mahi, and more. Some might say it's shrimply the best. Hey, Al. Hey there. How you doing? Chris Conklin has been running this place for 15 years. We're able to source the finest fresh local seafood known to man with our own fishermen and our own boats. His son Christopher, already a seafood fan, often coming to help out. Bingo, I see who's going to be taking over the business. Seven Seas was founded by Chris's dad, Phil Conklin, in 1985. So this is a giant bluefin tuna. That, um, there's Phil, my dad. Phil was an engine man in the Navy, later becoming an avid sports fisher. After a visit to Merle's Inlet, he fell in love with the marsh's bountiful catch and was inspired by local markets that caught and sold their own seafood. We own six of our own boats now that fish for the snapper and grouper, and we have two shrimping boats as well. Merle's Inlet has a long history of commercial fishing. Until the mid 20th century, slaves and black Americans who harvested fish here were known as Creek Boys. Following the Civil War, it became a paying job for any skilled fisherman. And they were young men who would have several families that they caught seafood for. The area's unique geography lends itself to a wide variety of fish and shellfish. So that inlet in between the ocean and the land is an interesting mix of brackish and fresh water. And that's where we get our oysters and clams and crabs and really unique, fresh, not too salty, but just salty enough. Today, Merle's Inlet is a hotspot for nightlife with plenty of restaurants and bars, but few seafood markets remaining. Seven Seas is one of the last places still catching and selling its own fish. Hey fellas, what's going on? Hi, have a good trip? Indeed. Nice. For Chris, a passion for seafood started as a kid. At 12 years old, he got his first fishing boat on the weekends, catching flounder to sell at Seven Seas. He joined his dad full time after college. We were like best friends, you know, we work all day, sweat, blood, tears, whatever. In the early 2000s, Chris's best childhood friend Henry Ford joined the business. We did a bunch of hunting and fishing together. Chris is like a brother to me. Henry soon became like a member of the family. The trio worked together until Phil's passing in 2018. It was a big, a huge loss, but you just gotta pick your chin up and keep on. Henry taking on more responsibilities. Today, he's a co-owner at Seven Seas. So the art to a very good fish display is uh, to make them look like they're all swimming. The market offering up to a dozen local seafood options from red snapper, bluefin tuna, to grouper, flounder, oysters, and of course, shrimp. They also bring in seafood from all across the country. Under Chris, they've expanded beyond retail, supplying several fine dining establishments across the city. How about this good looking seafood we brought to you? Chris is proud carrying on his father's fishing legacy. A lot of customers, they hold us near and dear to their heart and they, they like to brag, so uh, I enjoy being people's seafood guy. Time to see the seafood guy in action. Seven Seas processing thousands of pounds of fish and shrimp daily. I helped unload the market's latest catch, South Carolina white shrimp. Take it right up there to the scale. All right, here we go. On a good week, how many pounds will you, you sell of these? Um, a thousand pounds a day in the summertime. A thousand yes, pounds a day? Just shrimp, yes sir. The shrimp gets covered in a layer of ice. The final step? A lesson from Chris and Henry 
in the fine art of cleaning and deheading shrimp. What we do is we take the shrimp up like this. Uh -huh. And every shrimp you touch, you have to pinch it. Uh -huh. Why? Right? To pinch the head off. Right? Oh, oh. The shrimp get organized into three sizes, medium, large, and extra large. What makes South Carolina shrimp special? They come from really clean water. We don't have a lot of mud, and they're much sweeter. Can you taste a shrimp and tell whether it's come from South Carolina or not? 100% I yeah. can, yes, sir. Wow. How about you, Henry? Yeah, absolutely. Coming up, I get a taste of South Carolina's famous shrimp. After prepping a mountain of shrimp at Seven Seas Market, I couldn't wait for a taste of this fresh catch. Co-owner Henry Ford whipping up a spread of local shellfish steamed to perfection with their house blend of spices. And I've even got some uh, stone crab claws Chris and I went and caught yesterday. Oh, this is great. Oh, do you ever get tired of seafood? Absolutely not. I could, not at all. I could eat seafood every day if I could. Seven Seas also sells several house-made specialties, many crafted by Henry, including a smoky fish dip and a Carolina favorite, she crab soup. What is she crab soup? It's crab meat, um, and it's a cream-based soup. Oh, wow. And we sell out of it every day. Woohoo! Oh, yes, sir. I can see why. Just being surrounded by seafood all day isn't enough for these two. They find time every week to hop on a boat and reel in a catch together. So when you guys, Henry, are out on the boat uh, fishing, what's it like? Oh man, it's, it's actually, after being at work all week, it's actually heaven on earth to get out there. Chris, how important is it to continue this legacy of, of South Carolina seafood? We're like the last of the Mohicans. You know, it's a lot easier to get seafood from other places, other countries. We go through all the trouble of having our own boats and trying to perpetuate what little bit is left of the South Carolina seafood industry. That's why we stay so busy. Well, I gotta tell you, this is some of the best shrimp I've ever had. Yep. Oh, man, this is great shrimp. Oh yeah, it's good. You know what, for all your hard work today, after this lovely meal we filled your belly, I wanna give that to you as Ooh. a gift from Chris and I, saying thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, yep. sir. You're part of the crew now. Al. All right. Aye, aye, Captain.
My definition of soul food is food that is made with love and care. My mom used to always tell me, son, don't never make anything or never sell anything that you wouldn't eat. So that's my definition of soul food. Word has it, if you're looking for some real soul food in Myrtle Beach, Big Mike's has the best soul food in town. Born and raised in Myrtle Beach, owner Mike Chestnut is a well-known member of this community, bringing people together with recipes from his mom's kitchen for over a decade. Just, just like from Mama's house. And I'm like, man, this is delicious. I can't think of any soul food restaurant that I go to that is better than this. Time to meet Big Mike. Nice Welcome to, to see Big Mike. Yes, Mike. sir. Good to I'm see out. you. Hey. All right. Yes, so sir. You guys all work here, right? Yes, yep. sir. Yep. From Big Mike to Little Lennox, Big Mike Soul Food isn't just family owned. You got all family from top to bottom. My wife, Maxine, she works here. And then also my oldest son, Michael, and my youngest son, Marcus, and my daughter, Michaela. It's the whole family. I mean, it's a family reunion. You know, all all the whole ball of wax. Yes, sir. <laughs> Mike Chestnut, AKA Big Mike, has spent his entire life in Little Beach, and he's become a well-known figure about town. He's always willing to give a hand to anybody who needs it, and he also takes pride in his work. Since I grew up here, I just want to feel like I'm giving back to the community. I serve as a deacon at our church and city councilman, involved in a lot of other organizations, whether it's the NAACP or American Culinary Federation. And then the restaurant, that's my, that's my true love, I'll be honest with you. Where'd your love of food come from? I would got to say it's from my mom. She could get in the kitchen at seven o'clock in the morning and just had fun at what she was doing. Big Mike's mom, Rosalie Chestnut, worked in many restaurants in the area as a cook. With her encouragement, her son's kitchen career began at just 12 years old as a dishwasher. But it didn't take long for his diligence and talent to shine through. The chef that was there, he just saw something in me, and I remember he went to the general manager and said, hey, I want Mike to come back and prep with me. Mike worked the line at a country-style restaurant while going to school for not one, but two culinary programs. For nearly 20 years, Mike rose in the kitchen ranks, but he always dreamed of owning his own business. Mike soon found the answer to his prayers in a familiar spot. We um, saw this building, it was ready, and time was right. The high school used to be in the shopping center across the street, and we would actually jump the fence and come over here and eat lunch and go back. But who would have ever thought that 40 years later we end up buying the place? Sadly, Mike's mother passing away before she could see him fulfill his dream. What do you think she would think of this place? I think she would be proud of us to say you're trying to do something to keep the family together and mm -hmm. also provide a living and feed the family. What's the best advice you gave you? People always eat with their eyes. So if it looks good, it's going to be good. Uh, oh, man, does this look good. Sweet yams, mac and cheese, fried chicken, collard greens. Those are just a few of Big Mike's soul food specialties. Seafood basket, catfish with fries. Obviously, seafood is a big deal. Yes, sir. Here. Mm -hmm. What do you do seafood-wise? We do um, fried whiting, and then we do catfish. Serving up seafood is a sure way to catch diners' attention here in Myrtle Beach. Big Mike Soul Food carries on a culinary legacy that's steeped in history. The term soul food was coined in the 1960s as a source of pride for many African Americans. But the cooking tradition has evolved over centuries and continents. African Americans, when, when they were forced to live here, they had to do what they had to do. So they incorporated what we had here into the taste they had there, and they incorporated their master's taste too. So it all merged together to be a French, English, Scottish, Dutch, African American, Native American melting plot of flavors. Soul food restaurants began popping up all over the United States as black Americans migrated from the rural South, many becoming integral to their local communities. Is it important to have a, a, a black owned oh, yeah. restaurant? No question. As no part question. of the, the food scene? Yes, sir. It, it lets the community know, hey, if Mike can do it, I can do it. Because I tell people, you know, I grew up in a little area outside the city called Race Path. A lot of drugs, a lot of crime, and who would ever thought that we would be able to open up a restaurant in the heart of Myrtle Beach. I couldn't wait to get into the heart of this restaurant, the kitchen. 
We're going to do a Big Mac special today, meat and three. A signature meal of the South, meat plus three, three sides that is, started popping up in urban diners in the early 1900s. We're going to do some fish, we're going to do some hush puppies and some coleslaw oh. and some mac and cheese. All right, let's All right. get started. All right, well, we're going to start with some um, hush puppies over here. Hush puppies made from cornmeal batter can be sweet or savory. We probably go through a couple hundred of them, and wow. we do them all by hand. Let them cook for them a little minute. All right. And then we're going to come back over and do the fish. All right. Um, my fish is going in a, in a cornmeal batter, and we add a little bit of extra seasoning to this. Is that a little special little thing? special season that we make up there. It's nice and light batter on it. Right. With our fish and first side in the fryers, Mike whips up some coleslaw. Starting with all the usual fixings, cabbage, mayo, vinegar, but Big Mike has another secret ingredient up his sleeve. Some people don't put relish in it, but I put relish in mine. Relish? Oh, that's good. And the sweetness of the uh, relish. And that relish, I would have never thought of adding relish. And with our fish a golden brown, hush puppies fried to perfection, and coleslaw ready to serve, time for the third side, mac and cheese. Just how his mama made it. There we go, Ooh. Big Mike special. Oh, oh my God. Get a hit the spot. I mean, it's so light. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's not a heavily breaded fish. I'm a huge hush puppy. Okay. It's got, it's got this sweetness to it. Yes, sir. That is about as good as it gets. All right. Wow. Wow is right. I haven't had flaky fish like this since I was a kid back in St. Albans, Queens. I clean my plate, just like everybody else who walks through the doors here. I just want to leave something for my grandkids and kids to say, hey, this is a family thing and we want to keep it going. Just a stone's throw from the shore is Myrtle Beach's Arts and Innovation District. Winna's Kitchen is one of the newest restaurants in this part of town. Here, Chef Jess Sagan is delighting tourists and locals alike with her elevated brunch tables. She's also on a mission to give back to the community, extending a helping hand with warm meals to those in need. Hey, Al, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm oh, so glad to be here. And what's going on here? It seems like there's a lot of These cool are, kids hanging out here. They are. These are our grandchildren, my daughter Kenzie and her five kids. Now, you usually don't find kids studying at a restaurant, but here at Winner's Kitchen, owner Jess Sagan loves keeping her family close by. So close, in fact, that all five of her grandchildren are homeschooled right here in the basement. So there's always time for a bit of family fun. I'm on a rock right now. I'm on a base and I can't get down. I'm not into that. Jess's daughter, Kinsey, doesn't just teach here. She's also the co-owner and deeply invested in the heart and soul of this culinary adventure. I'm the brains and she's the brawn, but she's also the brains. I do a lot of the creative elements of the menu, but the day-to-day -day kitchen line 
restaurant is Kinsey. Even the name of the place is a nod to family. My mom's name was Linda. Her nickname was Winna. And when my mom passed away, she had a lot of regrets. And I knew that opening a restaurant was something that I would have a regret about if we didn't give it a shot. It was pursuing a dream, but also investing in a community that we believed in. At Winna's Kitchen, those facing homelessness are able to enjoy a meal totally free of charge. We say this all the time. We didn't open a 30-seat restaurant to make a lot of money. We opened a 30-seat restaurant to make an impact. And how do you do that? Our patrons can pay $5, and they'll either hang a card, it'll say number one, and we'll feed somebody for it, or they can take that card with them, and if they see somebody out on the street that they think needs it, they can give it to them. But our goal is to kind of restore dignity to people. They get to sit down at a table or the bar and be served. It's a calling that stems from her own journey. There was a point in your life where things were pretty tough. In my mid to late 20s, I, I took a leave of sanity, I say. I just checked out and I ended up making some really bad choices that led me into a place of addiction and ultimately homelessness. Then I ended up going to live at the rehab program for homeless people and I completed that program and 20, almost six years later, here we are. In rehab, Jess met her future husband, Walt, a volunteer from a local church program. Back on her feet, she devoted her professional life to her faith, serving as a worship pastor for two decades. What led you to opening up a restaurant? It is the food. We love to eat, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Jess and Kinsey got their start in the food world by catering benefits for a local nonprofit. After a string of successful dinners, they took the plunge, opening Winna's Kitchen in 2021. The first item on their menu, the free number one special. So what, what about for the folks who come in who need that meal? What, what's their reaction? The number one reaction we get is they are so hesitant to let us serve them. We often have people, they're like, hey, if, do you need help with the dishes? And I'm like, no, you're a patron. Jess doesn't stop at serving free meals. She's given many a second chance, employing people who have faced addiction or homelessness. Not a lot of restaurants give back to the community. How did that evolve? So there's this passage of scripture. When you invite people uh, to your house for a meal, invite the lowly in. And um, I would say it's easy to do nice things for people who are gonna do nice things for you. But the real gift in the kingdom for us is is doing things for people who can't do anything for you. And showing up for people who can't show up back. And loving people who might not ever love you back or even appreciate you back. That's really investing in people. And that's who we wanna be. I mean, it's, it's like, like dignity is on the menu. It is, dignity is on the menu. Kinsey is just as passionate about her mother's mission. I'm so proud of my mom. You're doing great, sweetie. I love you. She has experienced such a hard life, and her attitude, her ability to overcome is just, I think most people would just lay down and give up, and she, it just drives her to do more and be more. She teaches her kids at Winners so they can learn from their grandma's compassion on a daily basis. She is nice to everyone, and she's independent at the same time. The legacy my mom will give us is not this building, it's how she taught us to treat each other, how she teaches us to interact with each other. In addition to helping others, Jess is also dedicated to highlighting seasonal, locally sourced ingredients. My grandparents were very farm to table. I mean, before farm to table was a thing, uh -huh. both my sets of grandparents had gardens that we ate off of all summer. We're in the South, there's a lot of fried chicken and a lot of French fries and a lot of fried everything. But my daughter and I both like food that's a little bit different, a little bit elevated. The mother-daughter duo putting their spin on brunch classics like fluffy ricotta pancakes with lemon curd and a deconstructed chicken pot pie. Oh man, that was the best dessert I've ever had. But there's one dish that's been a menu mainstay since the beginning. When it comes to Jess's take on this Southern classic, the sauce is the boss. What's the thing that makes your shrimp and grits so special? It's our sauce. It's kind of this 
mix between cream and tomato. And it's infused with some secret spices and some ham stock. Maybe you show me how this is done. I'd love to. When is shrimp and grits? Starts with, of course, the shrimp. We try to use large local shrimp. They're really sweet. They got the perfect amount of salt. Stock gives her signature sauce a richer flavor. How do you make your ham stock? We don't share all of our secrets ah, here. Ah, OK. All righty. Just then searing the shrimp in clarified butter, seasoning them with Kinsey's secret spice blend. It does have salt, pepper, garlic, a little bit of dill, and a little bit of something, something else something, in it. Something, something, a little and something, something. I'm not being coy. I don't no, know, no. You're... I don't know what she puts in. Yeah. <laughs> and what's shrimp and grits without cheesy grits? Each batch made fresh every morning. Well, now, what kind of cheese is that? The main cheese in here is some coastal cheddar. The shrimp finished with a drizzle of buttery love. Then, time to plate it up. So we're going to let you help finish this off. Alrighty. This is a little bit of uh, Parmesan that mm -hmm. we just kind of chunked up. To top it off, cherry tomatoes and some microgreens. And of course, the best part, tasting. That's fantastic, Jess. When you present something like this to the community, how much pride does this bring you and Kinsey? I think it's why we do what we do. You know, shrimp and grits is a very, really a humble dish. And we've just taken it and put a ton of care into it. When I was growing up, people would say, love is a secret ingredient. It's true. And so elevating food is not just about making it fancy. It's about taking the level of care to make it look a certain way. Yeah. And I think that adds to nourishing people, not just with the food they eat, but their spirit too. Well, my spirit feels very good right now. <laughs> mm. Whether you're looking to kick back with casual beachy fare or enjoy elevated modern menus, Myrtle Beach is a seafood lover's paradise. The very best of South Carolina's most beloved dishes can all be found right here. And there's no doubt that the thriving restaurant community shapes the heart and soul of this vibrant coastal city. This episode of Family Style is sponsored by Visit Myrtle Beach. Welcome to The Boost. Today is International Thank You Day. And to kick things off, we're going to switch it up a little bit. We all heard of Teacher Appreciation Day, but at one school, the teachers sat down to thank their students. NBC's Kate Snow has that story. At Roseville Middle School near Detroit, the simplest of projects is reminding students and staff about the power of words. Are you wondering why you're here? Yeah. <laughs> Reading teacher Stacy Earle had a big idea. What did you ask your staff to do? I asked my teachers, secretaries, custodians, our cooks at lunch to write a card to a student, any one of their choice, of Thank you. why they inspire them. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So this year, they surprised some of the students with handwritten notes of gratitude. The reason why we invited you down here today is because we wanted to tell you that you inspire Miss Moore and I to come to work every day. The kids had their parents' permission to your be filmed by the school. Your humor. You're amazing. Thank you and so I love much. you. <laughs> you can see the experience was profoundly moving and for both for students you. and staff. You give me so much love in my heart and I love having class with you guys. I wanted to give you that and say thank you. Come here. Okay, now a real hug. <laughs> oh. Oh. You're amazing. <laughs> English teacher Emily Grimes presented letters to four students, including Amaya Brown. What is it about Amaya that you wanted to recognize? Her, her leadership. I narrowed it down to her because I, I guess the bottom line is that she's shown me that she's there for me as I am there for her. I wrote something for you. 
Social worker Julie Cooper's message brought eighth grader Alicia Turner to tears. I'm really grateful you're here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. She is an inspiration for me um, to come to work, and I really cherish the relationship that we have. She gives you good advice when, when you need it. More than 50 heartfelt letters in all, lifting up students and educators alike. You light up our classroom with your kindness, and you are going to make the world a better place. So. Showing up for each other in the most basic but powerful way. For Sunday Today, Kate Snow. Now to a truly inspiring story of one woman's perseverance to accomplish her goals and the mentor who helped her reach them. NBC's Priscilla Thompson with more. Good morning. After waving to the bus filled with students headed back to class, Taikisha Cross also drives to her first day of school as a certified teacher. I'm just elated. Walking in the same halls she once traversed as a student in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. There is no place like my classroom. Taikisha enters the classroom she now gets to call her own. How does it feel? It feels phenomenal. Um, it's been a very long journey, but it's definitely been worth the journey. Long and arduous. I actually grew up in this apartment. Taikisha says her mom was an alcoholic and her dad died when she was six. Her grandparents took her in. What was school like for you growing up? School for me was a safe haven. She thrived and excelled academically until life took an unexpected turn her senior year. I became pregnant. What did you think that would mean for your future? That my life was, in a sense, over. She stopped going to school, but school came to her. Her name was Yolanda Prim. She was then my uh, guidance counselor. She came to my house and told me, you know, I need you to come back to school. And I was like, you do see this baby, <laughs> you know? And she was like, so what? Come back to school. Mrs. Prim helped Taikisha earn her diploma, and she didn't stop there. She said, and you're going to college. No one in my family has ever been to college. I don't have any money, like, that's not something I can do. And she said, well, it's not a choice. Taikisha earned her degree and more, marrying her high school sweetheart and continuing to grow their family. But in 2015, after losing her job, her home, and her grandparents, Taikisha found herself at rock bottom until a chance encounter with Mrs. Prim led to a job offer as a substitute teacher. Showed up scared as can be. Seeing Taikisha was a natural in the classroom, Mrs. Prim pushed her to get certified. Four years later, Taikisha joined the Arkansas Teacher Corps, receiving her teacher certification in May. What did that moment feel like? A dream come true. Promise kept. It was a promise kept. But Mrs. Prim wasn't there. She'd moved to Texas the year prior. If you could see Ms. Prim today, what would you want to tell her? That she's a rock star. I'm going to continue to push that legacy. Little did Taikisha know, we brought Mrs. Prim to surprise her in person on this monumental day. What? Hello? Stop crying well again. I just <laughs> clear, clear my tears. What are you doing in Arkansas? Look at you now. I'm so proud of you, Cross. Is there anything that you want to tell her today since you're seeing her in person? I, I honestly don't believe that you know how important you are to me. You saved my life. You were just a counselor. And that wanting to be you is what pushed and motivated me. It means a lot. You never think that you're saving lives. You're just doing what you do. I love doing it. Taikisha now wants to use her journey to inspire her students. I hope that they understand that you can fall, but you better not stay there because it's not an option. What is your hope for Mrs. Cross as she embarks on this journey? That she stays with it. It will become a journey of a lifetime. We have another story of inspiration just ahead on a man who went from hardship to business success. What you can learn from him coming up.
right after this. the boost this next man built his business in the very same neighborhood where he grew up as a homeless teen well now he's hoping to make a big impact with each bottle that he brews in his micro distillery chris montana hasn't been back to his former high school in more than a decade he just feels very much like a son to me that i didn't have louise borman also known as frida this has to be pippin was his former theater teacher now, just a mile down the road in South Minneapolis sits Denord Social Spirit, the first black-owned distillery in the country that Chris started with his wife. Why here? I used to walk past this space on my way to high school. And as a kid, I didn't have any concept of being a business owner. Chris's mom struggled, and soon he was out on his own. I didn't have a, a, a home per se, but I was just couch surfing and you know sleeping in folks basements things turned around starting with the support of a friend's family they said well why don't you stay here for a few weeks and then a few weeks became why don't you stay here like through the year through high school and then i was formally adopted he would go on to pursue a career in politics and law but had a passion for brewing beer so how does distilling come into the picture I had half of the equation with brewing, and then the other half, I had a lot of help learning on the distilling side. He soaked up the knowledge, learned the science, and built a groundbreaking business in an industry where very few people looked like him. In 2015, I went to my first distillers conference, walked in, I was the only black guy in the room. A roughly 50% of Denord staff are people of color. I look for good people first, and then we build those good people. An approach that came into greater focus when George Floyd was murdered just blocks away. It's not pretty to look at, but it's it's our turning point. During the unrest, part of the warehouse went up in flames, but a renewed mission rose from the ashes. We see ourselves as part of social change. Philanthropy became the fuel to heal a community. Right next door, a food bank, which evolved into a foundation that fosters diverse entrepreneurship. I want to prove the business model. If you as a company invest in your community in a way that may not make you any money, that it will come back to you. Delta Airlines even taking notice, selling Denord 35,000 feet in the air. Did you ever catch a flight and order one of your drinks? Absolutely. <laughs> and for people like Frida, who helped him take flight, a spirit named after her. You're a huge influence in my life and at a time when I absolutely needed, I needed a Frida, <laughs> and you were there. I mean, things could have taken a much different direction. Oh, yes. He's aware of that. He made very good choices for somebody who didn't have options. I had someone ask me uh, the other day, do you feel like you're a self-made man? And the answer is absolutely not. I was pulled out of a number of situations by people around me. I'm in a better place, but I know what got me here. 
For today, Kathy Park, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Next up, Craig Melvin brings us the latest chapter in his Dad's Got This series. He visited with a Vermont dad who found a way to show his kids the value of giving back by warming the homes and hearts of those around them. He may look the part, but Eric Axelrod wants you to know he's not a professional logger. Weekends, I'm out there volunteering because it's an awesome commitment, right? It's, it's something that I've, uh, I believe in. And to be clear, you're not a lumberjack. I learned how to cut firewood safely. I heated my home for almost 15 years. And, you know, I'm good at watching YouTube videos. <laughs> With a little prodding from his family, Eric started a nonprofit organization called Wood for Good in 2019. Its mission? To provide families in need with firewood to heat their homes. How did Wood for Good come to be? We had some extra wood in our yard. And my wife said to me, what are you going to do with all that? And I said, I don't know, we'll have it for next year. And she said, uh, why don't you give it to some families in need? Shortly thereafter, my uh, older son was really moved by a family that we brought wood to. And he said to me, you know, I love this, Dad. I want to do it every day. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming out. These days, Eric relies on a group of volunteers that meet for weekend outings to help process and deliver the firewood. His sons, Devin and Logan, now 17 and 14, and his stepkids, Leo and Ivy, are part of the core group. Actually delivering the wood, you see the real smiles, and you're like, I'm not going to go cold this winter. We've had people who are, you know, burning their own furniture. They, they have no wood. They have no heat in Vermont, where it's, it's really cold, and they, it's kind of something that I feel like everyone should have. When you finish loading the truck or you finish splitting a load of firewood, it feels like you're accomplishing something that, that's meaningful and you're helping other people. Explain for folks who aren't familiar with winter in Vermont why firewood is so crucial. 40% of Vermonters heat with wood to a certain extent. Wow. Much appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. Much appreciated. Like many Vermonters, Joyce Blaisdell relies on a wood stove to heat her home. She contacted Eric after her husband underwent a surgery that made it impossible for them to split their own firewood this year. We're not the type of people who ask for help. We find a way to do it on our own. And when I did ask for help, it was just like instant. That touched my heart. As you go from, from home to home, you probably see some folks who are struggling. What have you seen over the years when you, when you drop off the wood? We brought wood to this family, and their father had just died. I didn't know that. And when we dropped the wood off, their younger daughter said, Daddy used to do this. And the mom started crying. Um, so just kind of moving moments where it's, you know, this is why we do it. I remember thinking like every time I'd come back to the wood lot, I'd be like, oh my God, how did you get this much wood split? Like if he puts his mind to doing something, it just, it just, just gets done. It started as you and your two sons taking wood to some families who needed it. Yes. What do you think you've taught them? How uh, it's really a privilege to be involved in giving back. Why? I feel really firmly that the world would be a much better place if more people were involved. And it's the fabric that brings us closer together because we're, we're more alike than we are different. And if people work together on helping people, I think it would help to heal some of the division. Up next, we are heading to Connecticut for a special surprise for a very deserving dad. That's right after this.
We're back on the boost. We've got a special surprise for a deserving dad in Connecticut. And our Donna Ferris and help deliver it. Check it out. I'm about to leave this amazing crowd, including Paula, Rich's wife, who nominated Rich. I'm walking over quietly to Rich's door right now, going to surprise him. Paula has described him as the introvert of the family. Oh, Bill, watch out. There's a step. So um, I just, I can't wait to see his reaction. And, you know, in his spare time, he volunteers as the deacon of their church. He is a community loving man. And um, I think that he's gonna be really surprised by all of the love that, oh, doorbell, I'm ringing the doorbell and knocking again, all the love that we're about to give him. And there's a lot of love behind this camera. <gasps> Hi, Rich. I'm Donna from the Today Show with Hoda and Jenna. You're live on the air right now. Come on out. <laughs> Surprise. Come on down here, Rich. You are so beloved. Look at this incredible crowd behind you. In front of you right here. Your, your wife. I know that you're wondering what in the world is going on. Come on over to your wife. Come on over to your wife, Paul. Right now, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know no what's going on. Well, I know you have no clue what's going on. We're about to show you what's going on because Paula wrote in and told us how wonderful you are. So take a look at this. I wrote in about Rich because we have just had our 25 year wedding anniversary. During those 25 years, we have both battled cancer. Rich had kidney cancer at age 35. I was his caregiver and then he beat the cancer, which was wonderful. When I got diagnosed with breast cancer, I was devastated. My husband came home and he held me and he said, you don't just have breast cancer, we have breast cancer, and together we are gonna fight and we are gonna win. My dad immediately stepped up. He took time off of work himself, so he was home with my mom. He did the weekly chemo treatments. I never once saw my dad like break down, but you'd think that would happen coming from a cancer survivor. He was there for her every step of the way. And then when it came time to shave my head, I was very nervous about that. And he said, I'll do it. My hair was just falling out like cotton candy. And then he gave me the clippers and told me I could shave his head. <laughs> and so we were brought together. There were times where she wanted to give up. Wow. I don't want to get emotional. Where she wanted to give <laughs> up. And he encouraged her that she could do it. You know, that they would get through it together. I felt like my husband deserved a surprise because he hasn't asked for anything. And I know that he's deserving because I'm here. And the two of us are here and we made it. And I always say to him, Rich, I'll be loving you forever. What are you feeling right now? Uh, my heart is content. I thought I was taking her to get her two teeth done. <laughs> I guess not. Wow, no, I think amazing. this might be the first lie she's told in 25 years of marriage. Yeah. No, I've, I see tears in the crowd. You are so loved. Everyone here talks about how much love you give and where they want to give it right back. What do you want to say to your community here? I just want to say thank you very much. I love you guys. We and love I appreciate you. It. What are you thinking right now? He prayed for me. He got me through. Everybody was along for our miracle healing journey. I am flat, happy, and healed, and so All grateful right. for this man. When I was weak, he made me strong. Yeah. Well, it seems it seems that he makes this whole community strong too. And I know I said that this is the ultimate love story. So we have one more surprise for you, Rich. Are you ready? All right. Well, I heard that it was your 25th. Uh, wedding anniversary yeah. Yeah, and you weren't able to celebrate it the way you wanted to because of your cancer treatments mm -hmm. so we want to give you a second go around at it oh. wow. what do you think about a trip to the caribbean <laughs> Royal Bahamian is gifting 
gifting you a five-day, four-night trip for two, the two lovebirds, at Nassau Paradise Island in the Bahamas. The trip includes the food, entertainment, and Nassau Paradise Island Promotion Board is also gifting you $1,500 credit to your round-trip airfare. Wow! What do you think? Awesome. Are you ready for a vacation? Yes, we are. Yeah. Thank you so much. Rich, thank you for being the wonderful man that you are. Can I give you a hug on behalf of America? We should also mention Rich is a cable installer for Comcast, the parent company of NBC Universal. Let's move on now to a story about the lifelong lessons that teachers can impart on their students. Take a look at the surprise connection between an airline employee and a passenger that brought them both to tears. It started as a normal flight. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Laura. That turned into something very special. And I'm going to get emotional. When Laura Caruso, a WestJet airline agent, hopped on the plane's PA system. Today I saw my teacher from 1990, Miss O'Connell, who's here on the board on the aircraft, who was my favorite teacher ever. And I haven't seen her since 1990. This lady made me love Shakespeare, got me to play piano. I have my master's in piano, and I can write an essay. Thank you, Ms. O'Connell. I love you. Laura then runs down the aisle and gives Ms. O'Connell a hug. You made my day. You made my life, Laura says, the two embracing in tears. Just moments before, Laura was helping her board the flight. You spot her on a flight you're working? Her voice was triggering in my head. I saw her face, and it was instantly where I said, oh, my goodness, you're Miss O'Connell. Laura, tell me a little bit about Ms. O'Connell. What is there to say besides she's an angel? Miss O'Connell pushed her to pursue her passions, writing, Shakespeare, and piano, lessons she now passes down to her daughter. My daughter loves reading now, and I think Miss O'Connell had something to do with that. When we reunited the two again over Zoom, the joy and love still overwhelming. You look lovely. <laughs> this is so amazing, isn't it? I know, isn't it? I'm overwhelmed right now. I'm sorry if I'm crying. Hey, Laura Cruz. Miss O'Connell still flying high from that surprise on board the plane. It was so amazing when Laura started crying and I said, what's the matter? Are you in pain? And then because she was crying, I started crying. And then she said, you're Miss O'Connell. And then I realized it was a former student. It just goes to show you don't know the effect you're having on your students, do you? That's the lesson Laura hopes people take away from her gesture, to take the time to thank those who made a difference in your life. Hey, thank you, Miss O'Connell, for always being there for me through high school and talking to me in the hallways and letting me know if I'm okay. Thank you so much for being so lovely. You've really made my day. Up next, you do not want to miss your daily morning boost. That's right after this.
Welcome back to The Boost. This is going to be a good one. Check it out. So a soccer team in England learned that one of its teammates' moms was battling pancreatic cancer and lost her hair because of chemotherapy. So in a show of support, they arranged for a barber to come in and shave every single one of their heads. And this is the moment mom arrived at the team facility to pick up her son. You can see her there. She's looking at the team and she's yeah. got a smile from ear to ear. Aww. And she saw those fresh new haircuts. And she kind of breaks into tears, overcome by emotions. That's kindness right there. By the way, the team started to go fund my page to support that family. Mm. That is love right yeah. there. Thank you guys so much for joining us right here on The Boost. I know a little boost feels good, and we're happy that we're able to serve it up to you. We'll see you back here tomorrow on Today All Day. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back, here we go. Mom. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. <laughs> happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. What time is oh, it now? Right. Best time of the morning. Right. That is pop star. Yes. I want you. But Pink is the you. And I miss you so much. Yes, You're delicious. Bam! Garson! Garson! I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post, and each week I'm here with the must-have fashion and beauty products at a price you'll like in Style Finder. I'm Shop All Day contributor Makon Jovu, and I'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media and influencer trends. And I'm Shop Today editorial director Adriana Brock, and I know shopping trends. I seek out new and notable products so you don't have to in editor's picks. This is Shop All Day, what's buzzing on social media. Hi, I'm Chassie Post and we're back today with a new episode of Shop All Day. All about those products we've seen on social media and wondered whether to add to cart. Well, we rounded out our favorite trending items from lip gloss, yes, it's making a comeback, to flared leggings, also popular again. And remember, see that QR code on the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. Or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. So let's get to it. Watermelon has been a mega trend when it comes to beauty products. And we have seen all things watermelon taking social media by storm. Now, watermelon sleeping masks are at the top of the social media heap. And few sleeping masks have received as much hype as the Glow Recipe Watermelon Glow Sleeping Mask. It's a TikTok star in its own right with over 2.2 million views and fans say it's worth the hype. But I gotta tell you, this sleeping mask had me at the word sleeping. I mean, who doesn't love a product? that goes to work when you hit the hay. And the brand says that this product not only is designed to help make your skin feel smoother, but it helps to refine pores. And they also say that it helps to brighten your skin and also exfoliate. Plus, it's got an impressive list of ingredients that includes real watermelon extract and even hyaluronic acid and AHAs, which is really glycolic acid. And I've got to tell you the scent. It smells so good. It's like fresh watermelons. And this product isn't just a social media star. It's a star in real life. Yep, it's got 73,000 likes on Sephora.com. Okay, now get ready for another TikTok star that beauty lovers are obsessed with. The Dior Addict Lip Glow Oil and this cult and celeb fave has a hashtag with over 73 million views and climbing. And lip gloss is making a huge comeback. And this ultra shiny gloss has been selling out everywhere. And here's what gets everybody so excited about it. It's a multitasker. It's like a lip gloss and a lip care product all in one. And the brand says that the lip oil is infused with cherry oil. So it nourishes and protects and softens the lips while adding a natural color finish. 
In fact, the brand also says that the lip oil is formulated to adapt to all lip colors to bring out one's own unique and rosy glow. And one of the reasons why lip gloss is having such a big comeback, in my opinion, is we are seeing so much gloss. I mean, on the face, that's been a really big trend, that sort of shiny trend. So it makes sense that it would also transfer to the lips. So now let's talk hair love. There's a lot of love out there for this next product as well as for its founder. These are the Nourishing Shine Drops from JVN, which is brought to you by hair guru and TV personality, Jonathan Van Ness. And the brand is so popular that the hashtag for this brand alone boasts over 10.8 million views. And I just love Jonathan's positivity and his enthusiasm and the brand's inclusive vibe. And I also love what the brand has to say about the product, that it makes your hair look like it's lit from within. I mean, shoppers really do rave about how these drops really bring about a rich glow and shine. And if you have a minute, you've got to check out the how-to videos on the site. Jonathan shows you exactly how to use this product, and it's so easy. I mean, you just take a few drops, and then you put them into your hands, you rub them together, and he says to take your hands and just rub it down from sort of the mid-shaft down to the ends and work it through. And Jonathan also says that this can be used on all hair types, and the brand says that the product also helps to smooth, frizz bust, and hydrate. Now next up, we have another trending and affordable accessory that in my humble opinion has the capability to transform any outfit in an instant. Yes, the pattern tight is having quite a moment and we're seeing some major traction from not only social media, but also from high-end designers. And what I love the most about this trend is that you can get in on this designer runway look without the designer price tag. I've actually seen pattern tights from high-end designers starting at $200 up to even $2,500. So forgive me if I get really excited that We've got such affordable options here. So here we have a selection of really great looking pattern tights. Everything from a herringbone to a beautiful lace to a heart motif. And we're seeing lots of heart motifs out there. That's a big trend even on its own. And my favorite way to wear them is to pair them with, say, last year's little black dress, right? And suddenly the look is transformed, it's updated. I love wearing these with trousers, especially crop trousers. So you can kind of see the pattern tight peeking out. And you know another really cool way to wear them? You can actually wear them with jeans and distressed jeans. Oh my gosh, they look so cool. You could see the pattern tight through some of the holes. It really is a little fashion trick that I love. Next, we've got a favorite from the aughts that are making a major comeback. I may have called them yoga pants, but Gen Z has dubbed them the flared legging. But one thing's for sure, whatever you call them, they are massive social media stars. So let me introduce you to the airy, real me, high-waisted crossover flare legging, and this style is a double winner. So not only does it have that great flare silhouette, Check it out, it has that crossover waistband that has become so incredibly popular. So the brand says that these leggings are made out of their real knee fabric, and they say it has light support, and this fabric feels really buttery. So it's a really versatile legging. You can wear it hanging out, you can wear it to the gym, you can definitely wear it while you're doing yoga. So I totally get why these are so popular. So now for a sneak peek at spring, let's talk about an incredibly popular shoe that encompasses four big viral trends in one. This it shoe has been on the scene for a while now and thanks to its popularity both on social media and on celebs, we don't see it going anywhere. So let me tell you about what those four trends are. First of all, we've got that mule style, the mule silhouette, which is just really slip in and easy to wear. Also, check out these braided straps, the double strap. They're also kind of padded, so that's another massive trend that we're seeing. 
Also, the block heel. It's a lot easier to wear than the stiletto, especially if we're transitioning from sneakers. And another big trend that we're seeing everywhere is this squared toe sole here. And I really like all of these sophisticated neutrals, and these are essentially a designer dupe. And lastly, I really think that they look expensive. So this is a great viral trend to try out coming up this spring. And this next must-have is one of the coolest fashion gadgets I've run across in a long time. It's the Nori Press, and it has changed the game in both design and innovation. And it is no wonder that it has over 1.4 million views on TikTok. And it's a wrinkle-removing tool. And it's like a cross between an iron and a steamer. And Boy, do I wish I had one of these when I first started out in my fashion career as an assistant to a celebrity stylist. I can tell you guys that I spent about 90% of my time steaming. So I got well acquainted with the conventional steamers and I gotta tell you, pretty much all of them leak. So I was thrilled to try out the Nori and I think the design is just so cool. I mean, look at that. It almost looks like a straightening iron and it works like one too. And one of the things I like so much about when I use this is it's just really easy and it also irons both sides of the fabric at once. So you just clamp it onto the fabric and just pull it down. And oh my gosh, it really is a game changer in the world of ironing and steaming. You don't even need an ironing board. So I love that ease. Plus it's 1.4 pounds, so it's great for travel. You can throw it in your bag and go. So let's go through these products one more time. And you can use the QR code to get instant access to these items. We've got the Glow Recipe Sleeping Mask, the Dior Lip Oil, the JVN Nourishing Shine Drops, the Pattern Tights, the Offline by Airy Flare Leggings, the Women's Braided Heeled Sandals, and the Nori Press Steam Iron. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. And that's it for Style Finder. Up next, designer and lifestyle influencer Vanita Aspen is chatting with Mako and Lovu about some of her favorite must-have products.
Welcome back. I'm Makon Jovu, and this is Influencer Trends, where I'll be talking to industry insiders and they'll share their favorite products and the must-have items to shop for right now. Now, you may know her from Southern Charm, designer and lifestyle influencer Vanita Aspen is here with us to talk all things Southern style and more. And don't forget the QR code on the corner of your screen. Use the camera on your smartphone and scan it to shop these products, or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. Vanita, it's such a pleasure to have you here. How are you today? I'm doing good, how are you? I'm doing great. Listen, I remember the first time I saw you on social media, I was like, wait a minute, who is this gorgeous girl? So I had to hit that follow button. What do you think, you have a huge social media following, what do you think gets people to sort of gravitate towards you? I think people gravitate towards me because I choose not to stick within an aesthetic and like I'm different every day. I show the ins and outs of daily life and the fact that everything's just not perfect. I love that. And I love the um, the photos that you have of you and your mom. So cute. And then you also show a style as well. What's the key to looking pulled together? The key to looking put together is always jewelry. You have to wear like some form of earring or bracelet. That helps pull the entire look together. So if you're not feeling too strong about it, an accessory will definitely help. I agree with that. Accessories are like the cherry on top. Now, Southern right. Charm fans would just not have it if I didn't ask you. Are we going to see more of you on the show? I don't know, you're gonna have to watch it. Oh, okay, <laughs> a nice little tease there. I'm here for it. Okay, speaking of things to watch, I love these items that you brought for today's show. Can we start with these portable chargers? A great deal yeah. for two of them. You yeah. get two, I chose the black and white ones. They charge super quick and they're really lightweight so they don't like weigh the bag down. I feel like a lot of portable chargers are too heavy and this is like a great weight. Absolutely, and I think they're great for every household. If you think how many people in your house have devices, so it's nice to always have chargers. All right, let's move on from chargers to something that charges my life, which is makeup. This blush that you brought here, okay? First of all, you look gorgeous. I have it on. I to say that. Right, you have it on? Okay, but why cream, cream over powder? Cream over powder because cream looks more natural. And I love this blush because two reasons. You get a lot of product and it's super affordable at $6. Oh. And the pigmentation is unmatched. I mean, I'm swatching it right here and I have to agree with you about the pigmentation. It's unmatched. And I like this for all ages too. It looks great on everybody. Even if you have mature skin, it's beautiful. Okay, so one of the things I am guilty of, Vanita, is not cleaning my devices, even my sunglasses. I love this next pick, tell me about it. Okay, so the next pick is just so good, and I love the fact that it comes with microfiber tiles, so you make sure that there's no lint or anything like that on your screen or on your sunglasses when you're done wiping your products down. Oh, I love that. Look at how it just cleaned my sunglasses. I'm so guilty of having foggy glasses, so this is a lifesaver. Okay, speaking of lifesavers, let's talk about being in the kitchen. A lot of people don't really like prep work when it comes to cooking. This vegetable chopper, I'm obsessed. Also, like to give you a little background, I went to culinary school. Oh. So like, look at that. I love all the little fun inventions for the kitchen. And I feel like this vegetable chopper is a lifesaver for everyone because one, no one likes to chop onions. No one likes to chop potatoes and it just makes it so simple. It has like, this little square here and it comes with different size like blades you can see right here and it's just perfect and it's easy to clean oh i love that onions make me cry is that crazy but it's true to this day they still make me cry so i love that yes and then a little tip for you is to either run your onion under hot water or put it in the freezer right before you cut it so I shouldn't say the fumes, but like the aroma that they come out quickly. <laughs> I know what you mean, I know what you mean. And last but not least, you talk about jewelry being the key to looking pulled together. You have this jewelry organizer, which I think is fantastic. Yes, it comes in three different shapes. Um, so I also, I have one for both bracelets, necklaces, and earrings. And it's just so easy and things don't get tangled up and you just don't have to think about it when you're gonna get dressed and put your accessories on. I find that it saves me money too because I'll go out to the store, I'll shop online and be like, wait, I already have that because I can see it in my jewelry organizer. Well, Vanita, thank you so much for joining us. What else are you up to? What else are you working on next? Right now, I am working on an adaptive wear brand. So that's a project that nice. is keeping me busy. 
Oh, that's awesome. Listen, we look forward to following you and good luck with all your adventures. We'll see you really soon. Thank you so much. All right, bye. All right, now let's run through the products one more time. The portable charger, the e.l.f. Cosmetics Cream Blush, the Woosh Screen Cleaner Kit, the Full Star Vegetable Chopper, the Stratolife Jewelry Organizer. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. Up next, Adriana Brock has more popular products in editor's picks, like a cordless vacuum that weighs just three pounds, just in time for spring cleaning. Don't go away. Welcome back, I'm Adriana Brock, and we have been sharing those products we can't get enough of that we've discovered on social media. I have some more favorites from Old Navy's new three-in-one jeans, more on that in a bit, to the Va Broom, just in time for spring cleaning. See that QR code on the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. Or you can text shop to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. So let's get started. Finding the perfect pair of jeans doesn't have to be hard, and Old Navy is making it easier than ever with the new Fits You denim collection. Each pair is designed to fit three different sizes to adjust to your perfect shape. This one features the best-selling Rockstar Skitty Cut, which has a flattering high-rise fit and a wallet-friendly price. And moving on to some beauty finds, Milk Beauty is one of those popular beauty brands taking over social media, and their new launch is no exception. The brand's brand new Rise Mascara is a vegan mascara that, according to the brand, is formulated to lift, lengthen, and curl lashes with weightless volume. And according to the brand, all you need is a few coats and you don't have to worry about clumping or smudging for up to 12 hours. And when it comes to accessorizing, a cute headband is the perfect way to add a little pop to any outfit. And it helps amp up a good hair day. The knotted headband trend isn't going anywhere, but pearls are actually the latest accessory that's taking over the fashion world. So with this one, you get two trends with this chic find. And 
you get a set of four for about $15. And if you're like me, you're probably gonna wear these all the time. And staying on the topic of hair, Heatless curlers are having an unexpected social media hit this season. These come with a set of 28 heatless waivers and all you need is about 20 for a full head of hair. And according to the brand, to use it, all you have to do is grab small sections of damp hair and weave it into the curler using the tool. And in about an hour, you're gonna get a full head of waves and curls. And you've gotta see the results to believe them. And you don't have to be on hashtag clean talk to appreciate this next find. It's a two-in-one cleaning tool that's simply genius. It's a lightweight cordless broom with a built-in mini vacuum that will have you ditching that dustpan for good. The Va Broom does all the work for you. So once you're done sweeping, you just tilt the broom on its side and it sucks up all the dirt and debris in one go. Voila. Household chores have never been so much easier. And speaking of chores, if you're like me and your handbag is probably a catch-all for everything and it can get dirty so fast, this clean ball is really cool because it's designed to pick up dirt and crumbs, everything that's floating around in that bag. All you have to do is pop it in your purse. You can even use it in the kid's backpack and it does all the work for you. And the brand says, what's really great about this too, is you can reuse it. You just pop it open, you wash it, and you can use it over and over again. And we all want to get organized, and labels make the job so much easier. So whether you're tackling your file cabinet or a spice rack, this little wireless label maker is absolutely incredible. It creates labels using an app that lets you customize everything from size, font, and even symbols. And you know we love a QR code, and this one can actually make one. Last, but certainly not least, is this pizza maker that's taking TikTok by storm. It is one of those things you wish you had discovered sooner. It's a rotating pizza oven and it makes delicious crispy pies in about 25 minutes. But it can also be used to cook other snacks like chicken wings and quesadillas, grilled sandwiches, and even a cookie pie. It comes with a self timer and a nonstick coating on the pan. So according to the brand, cleanup is an absolute breeze. This one has us so excited to entertain this spring and summer. This product is really great. So let's run through the products one more time. The Old Navy 3-in-1 Rockstar Jeans, the Milk Makeup Rise Mascara, the Velvet Headbands, the Heatless Curl Kit, the Va Broom, the Clean Ball, the Wireless Label Maker, and the Pizzazz Pizza Oven. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. That's it for Editor's Picks and our show today. Here's a sneak peek at next week's episode of Shop Today with Jill Martin. Shop Today is back, bringing you amazing products, the hottest tips, and inspiring conversations. And now to celebrate Women's History Month, we're highlighting products by incredible female founders from skincare to fashion, jewelry, and more. Plus, boxing champ and entrepreneur Layla Ali stops by. What do you think your past has taught you that has brought you to be this incredible businesswoman? I always had this desire to be independent. It's not about just how many hours I work. It's really about how much I put in, how much effort I put into growing these businesses. It took a lot of hard work. It didn't just happen overnight. This is Shop Today with me, Jill Martin. Welcome to Today All Day. All Day? Today All Day. All Day. This is a long oh, way of asking man, yeah. who's your favorite okay. character you've ever oh, played. The right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> what is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Hi, buddy Cal. Cooking with me. That's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today. With simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit oh, now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. We received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do the weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, wow. Ambush Makeovers. 
Okay. It doesn't look so good. No, it doesn't look good. Will you okay. judge us in a cook-off? I yeah. will, and okay. you guys will definitely win something. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today, All Day. Over the years, I have been lucky enough to step into the Today Show kitchen and watch the best chefs from around the world teach us some incredible recipes. We had made that pesto, which was, oh, exactly. darn. Oh, right you know, I almost got that out of this one clean. Cool. Turn it down. <laughs> oh, my God. I had one job. None of which I mastered because I didn't know the first thing about how to cook. But those days are behind me for good, and I'm finding some confidence in the kitchen. Now, my friend and all-around superstar, Drew Barrymore, and her chef, BFF, Pilar Valdez, are gonna teach me a few weeknight favorites. We're gonna be making a watermelon salad with pistachio duca and shrimp scampi with bucatini, both from their cookbook, Rebel Homemaker. I am so excited to be cooking with these ladies today, so let's get started. Drew and Pilar, I need to know everything you know. Well, I know that I love you. I know that I love you. She really does, and we're so excited to be here. What's the plan, Pilar? So today's plan, we're gonna cut the watermelon, pickle the rind, prepare the duca, assemble the salad, cook the shrimp and pasta, make the pan sauce, plate, and serve. So first up yeah. for our watermelon salad, we're gonna break down the watermelons. I do love a good piercing, but now of course I'm stuck. Oh, this is good. Wow, this Boom. Was... Savannah, you're doing great over there. Oh. It's Don't not a competition. Mad. Look at the difference between our two heads. <laughs> Look at your melons. Oh my gosh. And put the other half That's what I was aside. thinking. Why are we so juvenile? <laughs> When are we going to turn 14? I know. Okay. I see how this episode yes. is going to oh, go. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to lob off the top of it. We're going to just take off the dark green. Mine doesn't look anything like yours so does, So what Pilar. happened with yours, Drew, is that you didn't, um, you took off, you were overachieving. You took off the skin and the rind. Um, but our first step was just to do uh, the skin. So Savannah, you can continue on what you were doing and okay. now we're just taking off the rind. So exactly okay. the same kind of oh, okay. sawing and shaving motion downwards. Okay. And now are we keeping it off. this rind? We are, because that's what we're going to pickle, oh. actually. Mm -hmm. So you're going to take your watermelon, and you could cube this, but for this salad, mm -hmm. I actually like to cut it in irregular shapes. I feel good about this part. Yeah. That looks really good. Yeah, it does. So you're going to take your rind, rind basically, yes. and we're going to uh, dice it. Okay. You're going to flip it over so it has, yeah. Mm -hmm. Savannah, I can see the claw coming out, which is really good. I'm trying to learn. You want to yeah. tuck in those I like digits. to cut like this. I do too. I'm like, I like to lop off. And this would Thickness. be a dicing, this not is a, a dice. mince. Nope. Because What's it's pretty What's the difference chunky. between dicing and mincing? Size. So the, absolutely. Size, <laughs> size matters. <laughs> I'm going to take a sip on that. What are we drinking? This is so good, by the it way. Is so what good. is it? It's a mocktail. It's a version of a Pimm's. It's based on a Pimm's cup, which is usually with gin. But this oh, one is without. Way, you would never know there was an alcohol in <laughs> here. Oh my gosh. Drew what loves, is that? Very gingery, right? Yeah, so there's ginger beer, and Drew, I know you love tea, so it's a combination of black and rooibos. Okay. That's a very unique flavor. Yep. <laughs> it's okay. so good. 
All right, so wait, what do right. we do now? Pickling anything is a flavor profile that I really love. Oh, me too. It is basically uh, equal parts water and apple cider okay. vinegar. So, Savannah, so three you're gonna add that. Water. Mm -hmm. Three fourths cup water, three fourths cup apple cider vinegar. Got mm -hmm. it. And then one you can actually, um, and then one, mm -hmm. exactly. Ooh, I like the honey equal bear. parts um, a lot. Yeah. It's just such an easy brain no. yes. ratio to remember. Yeah. yeah. Let's add in uh, the salt. What, are you sprinkling it on purpose? Uh -huh. or are you just trying? <laughs> no, I am because I don't like the dump. Is yeah. like then you have to work harder to get the solubility if you shake it in. I feel like it's just a better. That's method. actually a very good pro tip. And All then right. Drew, I'm gonna have you add in the fennel seed, which is half on top. Half teaspoon. Half seed, teaspoon of fennel please, seed. Honey, lovely. Sprinkle on in. Uh, you got crazy. It's how you half usually teaspoon uh, coriander. There seed. you go. I'm and we're going to do half a teaspoon of the cumin. Oh. And then the last thing is half a teaspoon of the pink peppercorn. I love pink peppercorn, and I especially love it on green dishes. Yeah. Oh. Savannah, have you had pink peppercorn? No, I before? have not. So they're really, and you can actually take a little and take a little bite, and they're like very fruity and floral. Oh, yeah, but they're not super, a little peppery, but not as pungent as a yeah. box. It's gonna basically come up to a little bit of a simmer. Okay. And as long as the honey and the salt is completely dissolved, then you can pull it off. Drew, you're gonna carefully pour it into our one cup okay, of she water. Me too well. She's like, you know that graceful <laughs> ginger side of yourself yes. that you don't have tried. Right. You're just to pouring it. it right over. Yep. Then what happens? After 30 minutes, this is gonna be good to go. Like so freshness. easy. Super easy. That's pickling. That's pickling. pickling. Boom. Boom. We're moving on to the pistachio dukkha component of our salad. Okay. Dukkha is an Egyptian condiment. It's usually a blend of like nuts and seeds and spices. You okay. should have some coriander, coriander. seed. Mm -hmm. Two, teaspoons Two teaspoons of coriander seed. Okay. Is this is this the cumin? That's cumin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Absolutely. Going off. Oh. Going wrong. Okay. Then if she's it's one, rogue. So one quarter so cup of sesame seeds. Hold, hold on the sesame oh. seeds. Actually, Savannah, so you're gonna toast that. Can we first. turn it up? How high should it be? Um, let's do medium. Okay. Okay, and it's an empty plate. There's no oil or anything. No, absolutely okay. not. You want it in a dry skillet. They have skillet. oils on them, right? Yes, they do. So they're starting to release it, and you just have to shake it occasionally, not okay. constantly. Okay. Um, and you're gonna notice a change in color. They're gonna start to get a little darker, but really what you're looking for, Savannah, is the smell. Okay. It's gonna start to like release this like toasty smell. You're gonna smell the coriander. It's gonna mm -hmm. be very floral. It's starting. Can you smell yeah. it? Let's give that a shake, actually. Oh, actually, yeah. yeah. I can. Ooh, I like it. And yes. on the average, would you say about two minutes, Colorado? About two minutes, okay. yeah. Take it off, because okay. I can see a okay. little bit of heat. Let's okay. turn oh, yeah. off the pan. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now what? Um, and you're gonna divide, actually, the spices between your and Drew's mortar and pestle. Habsy, habsy. What I like to do when I have spices is that instead of go in and like bash 
brush immediately. I kind of like to muddle, so a circular motion, and that helps it break down because okay. if you go in and you're bashing, it's yeah. gonna like firework spices okay, so everywhere. So I'm like just kind of stirring. So, yep. Could I start smashing yes, now? Yes, I think so. And you can apply a little more pressure to Savannah. Am I trying to get this to like a very fine grain? Pretty, pretty fine. So with the duka, we want a little bit of a mm. play on texture, so you'll have fully ground pieces and then some pieces that are just more broken up. So I'm happy mm -hmm. with where mine is at. How do you like mine? What do you think? Beautiful. Oh, Lovely. That's good. Good. Yeah. That's and nice. I think you you guys can both pop uh, your spices, Savannah and Drew, into that bowl. Okay. Into one bowl. Into one okay. bowl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yours is nicer. I and think. that's really nice because then you guys have a, a uh, texture. Yeah. Yes. Play on I texture. I went hard, you went soft. Uh, well. So now we're going to toast the sesame seed. Okay, we need one quarter cup sesame seed. So mm -hmm. just let it go in there. Unlike, yeah, you can shake it a little. You can <laughs> use the spatula. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sesame seeds, as soon as they start to change color, you want to take them off the heat. So keep stirring that, Savannah. They're going to go golden really, really quickly. I can okay. smell them, so I think we're almost there. Okay. And you definitely don't want to burn them. No. Burning bad. Yeah. Okay. Burning bad. <laughs> While Savannah is uh, toasting the sesame seeds, Drew, I'm going to have you add in um, our salt. Our That's flaky a, sea salt. Is this a maldon? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. It's a One. tablespoon into that bowl where your spices are. I love a maldon. I do too. It's so different I than other salts. I put it on salts. top of my chocolate chip cookies. Yes. yes. Nice. Look at you. I did not. <laughs> I a little baking skill. And then Drew, you're going to do, um, those are hemp hearts or hemp seeds. Two tablespoons. And hemp seeds. Savannah. Yes, they're really great forms of protein and fiber and vitamins, actually. And again, it's like we're playing a lot with textures. Yeah. So that's a really lovely addition. Your favorite, Drew, half a teaspoon. I would say, Savannah, maybe 30 more seconds on that, and then we're going to be good. Mm -hmm. um, a pink peppercorn okay. and just a smidge, a smidge, smidge, smidge of black pepper. Okay. Smidge. That's more that, than that's a smidge. Plenty. That's definitely more than a smidge. Wow, you have a hot. <laughs> I love <laughs> spicy pepper. Tongue. Everything okay. could be coated and rubbed in pepper. All right, do you think we're good on these seeds? Let me see. I feel like they're mm. almost there, okay. right? They're almost turning golden. But <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, we need music. All right, okay. I think that looks really good, Savannah. Okay. So let's uh, turn off the heat. Mm -hmm. Dump them yeah. in. Dump it in. And now we have the pistachios. I can just kind of like Absolutely. do this like Savannah, Julia Child like style. That's great. You're kind of rocking back and forth. Am I making you proud, Pilar? You are making me so proud. This second. <laughs> I'm actually going to stop you guys right there because I really like the two textures that we're playing with. Okay. Savannah's on like a finer and then Drew's is on a rough. So we're, we've established this a is a really good combo. <laughs> we're going to scoop all those nuts into this bowl. Scooping the nuts. Yeah. Pretty colors, too. Really, really pretty, yeah. And Drew, you're gonna give it a good mix. No pistachio left behind there. No pistachio mm -hmm. left behind, please. Okay, that looks amazing. Yeah, and I'm busting out something here that I was told. It's a gold box Savannah's tasting spoons. Do you have special spoons? They're just special because you're supposed to taste your food. Did you know that? I didn't, and now I do. So just take a little. Take a little, and and then we can sort of play from there. So mm. it's gonna be, it's gonna have that floral from. Yes. I like it. I wouldn't yes. change one thing, would you? It's it has perfect. enough salt, enough pepper. It, it really, really does. does. <laughs> All right, success, ladies. The love story continues. <laughs> we made duka. We're gonna assemble the salad, but when we're plating it, it's gonna be a little bit of a friendly competition. Ooh. And then. Let's go. You guys got this. All right, okay. so in your little jar um, is a simple lemon vinaigrette. Okay. It's just lemon, olive oil, salt, and pepper. Okay. And it's separated a little, so just give them a little shake. Mm -hmm. It emulsifies it, which is there you ever go, so Drew. important. If anyone's doing an oil and vinegar salad, emulsify it first, it'll taste 50 times better. Okay. Dropping your knowledge. All right, so in your bowl, you have a little bit of arugula. So I like to coat a little bit of the bowl. I know it sounds crazy, right, Savannah? But I'm not going to use all of that. No, yeah. you don't have to, and you dress the taste. But when you coat the side of the bowl, you're basically not dumping it on the leaves. And then now we can start building. Okay. So a little arugula on the plate. Remember, oh. you're making something beautiful. Okay. okay. A arugula on the plate. This is where the competition. Is. Yes. Okay. So and what's then our next one? Your watermelon slices. You're going to dip it in the duka. 
Oh, dip it in the duka. And however you want to <laughs> dip it is up to you, and you're going to lay it yeah, on you, the plate. You duka you. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. So you're just dipping those watermelon slices. And oh, I like to leave a bit of it without the duka, just so that it has that freshness, and then you'll get the pop. Oh, so of the some crunch. duka and some don't. <laughs> But I mean, I'm actually asking. I feel like this should be like late night comedy. I know. I know. Just like... cheesy, like Rodney Dangerfield. By the way, the best. Okay. Here, there's no rules. Okay. Don't forget to finish also with your pickled watermelon rind. You can scatter it around. How can I win? What if I make like a tower? I know. You can totally make a tower. Thinking of tower. A little like time. Jenga. Okay. And then you can finish with a little bit of Maldon salt also, okay. which just like brings all those flavors together. I learned from little that. salt bay Maldon salt. Oh, I love it. I don't know. Shall we? Oh, uh, Vogue, <laughs> Vogue for the camera. Yes, let's, I think we know who's his best. It's yours. <laughs> this looks very pretty. Really? It, it really does. I like I your th little tower. I feel like they're both. They're both pretty. They, I also feel like these are three extremely different, different approaches. <laughs> yeah. You went like just. Put it on the plate. No, actually, I feel like yours has like a, um, a, a, a Lanes, strategic right? pattern. Yeah. No, it does. And yours is sort of abundant, <laughs> and mine is amount. I love it. All, All right. right, shall Cheers. we? Shall we walk? Yeah. Let, oh, Cheers, let's guys. Doing one of Drew's favorite recipes. Scampi. 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 Who's I, gonna devein and have their way with those shrimp? Well, they actually are already peeled and deveined, although Drew is killer deveining them. <laughs> All right, but we've got the water boiling. We've got the water boiling. Did, did we salt it like the sea? I love that. Say it again, Savannah. I, salt it like the sea. Thank you. Okay. So, Drew, what I'm going to have you do actually is season the shrimp. So, that's actually baking soda. Mm. And so, we're going to do just a quarter teaspoon, Drew, and you're going to sprinkle it all over the shrimp. And the reason why we do baking soda, mm -hmm. I love it, is that it basically helps no the shrimp brown and get this really beautiful color. Oh, okay. And then we're gonna do salt and pepper mm -hmm. on your shrimp. I feel like you should be doing this. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've seasoned it with salt and then we'll uh, give good. it a good toss. I love okay. a little flour, a Look little it, I egg learned. wash. I'm shimmying my salt. No not dumping. Over here. <laughs> that, no, not anymore. I'll never dump a again. Little. So we're gonna let the shrimp that has salt and pepper and baking soda sit for about like five or ten minutes. And meanwhile, we are going to attack our garlic. Okay. Um, so today we're gonna slice the garlic fine. We don't wanna crush it because that's just gonna burn in our sauce. Mm. So what I like to do is just take the tip off. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of 
around this. You're gonna spin it, we're gonna cut it lengthwise. Not okay. Fast. You have some olive oil. We're gonna do three tablespoons. Happy to eyeball it. There's also a measure if you'd like, but. Well, the, like, I've been encouraged to eyeball, I so I'm gonna try. Eyeball. I think this is one tablespoon. I think that's good. Two. Yeah. Three. Beautiful. Do you agree? Yeah. Kind of, sort of? That's really, really great. And then you're just gonna rock it. Our baby's all grossed up. <laughs> She's eyeballing. Oh, no. yeah. I eyeballed. Okay. okay. And what you're gonna do, Savannah, is add the garlic. Mm -hmm. Put it right in there? Yeah. You don't want too high of a heat no. and to end up like me who burns their garlic. And okay. Drew, you're gonna add the red pepper flakes. Okay. <clears throat> and having enough oil helps you not burn the garlic. Okay. Mm -hmm. How many? Half a teaspoon, so just that measure. And if you want things spicier, you can go more. You, you know, know she again. does. Miss Spicy over she likes. It's gonna start to change color. It's gonna go kind of translucent, translucent. and sticky. I, I have feel it like in. You can start pulling. Okay. Um, you do this. So we were just whoo, um, infusing the olive oil mm, basically with good. that garlic and pepper okay. uh, flavor. Okay. Okay. So what? Throw this in. You're gonna throw it in, and then you're gonna give it a good stir. And we're using bucatini, um, which is basically like a, a thicker spaghetti with a hole in it. Okay. Um, but you could use any sort of long shape of pasta, and you're gonna cook that pasta until just al dente okay. because we're gonna finish it off in the sauce. Okay. Um, do but sauce. you're gonna lay the shrimp down in a single single layer, okay. and you're not gonna stir it, you're gonna shake it, you know, lay occasionally, it lay it down, yeah. Actually, will you hold, Savannah? You don't think it's hot enough? Yeah, so. Stand back. How are you, what are you looking at there. to know if it's so hot enough? So you want a, a little bit of ripple, you do not want smoke, we're not okay. like, trying no. to. And no bubble. <laughs> Wait, let me. You want this. that sizzle and you're not getting Oh yeah, it. I'm definitely wanting, I can see it a little bit here. Let me, can I borrow that? There you go. Here you go. There oh. you go. There you go. Oh. So let's start. Yeah, Here interesting. You go. I stepped away. Everything started <laughs> functioning. Meanwhile, my arm is going to fall off. Um, holding these. Oh, uh, yeah. Shrimp. That, you know what? I hear what you're talking about yeah. now, Pilar. Yeah. There's a deck that That's sizzle. why she wanted to hear this. No wonder. Yeah. All right. People always talk about, talk about cooking, you know, like smell and what you can see. Mm. I'm always like, I'm like, I can hear my water boiling. I can hear it sizzling. Oh, like, I like that. She brought in the strongest sense of them all. <laughs> exactly. The color will start to tell you when pink. it's cooked. It starts to get pink. Its and tails are already pink. Yep. Do it's, I need to flip them over ever? Not You know yet. what, let's, I think it's a little too early, but you, let's peek at one and basically the color will have changed and it's gonna have a little bit of like kind of, sp ooh, okay. That was so good to me. A little more. Okay. And you can give the pan a little bit of a light shake but we're not. You like, don't mess with we're don't not them. Yeah. So Savannah, when you flip them, you're gonna kind of move them to a different. Okay. Uh, They're gonna go different, in different spot. There moving you a different go. neighborhood. Yeah. Because it does, you know, some stuff will have heat dip could I know. I'm gonna have you add two tablespoons of that butter. So that's one, one two, two, beautiful. Just into that pan. Uh, Ooh, now lovely. we're talking. The reason why we put just the two pats of butter right now is that you're basically starting to build that flavor. Right. You touch it with your finger right now. You see Pretty how firm. firm it is? Yes. Okay. Is that a good thing? That is a really good thing. Okay. So we're almost there. So we're just going to rescue the shrimp. Mm -hmm. Take them out? Take them out, leave the butter in and cook in. Okay. And oh, they're, I... they're basically like That's almost it. done. Mm -hmm. We're gonna finish them off with the pasta and the sauce. Drew, will you actually, speaking of pasta, stir. I've forgotten. Um, please stir it. Test and it. then maybe just uh, try a new, no, very far. Nowhere All near. Right. All right. Hard as a rock. <laughs> Al dente. Stiff right. as a board. This is like, it's gonna, pencils. Sure. Uh, that's great. So that's no, great. that's, oh yeah. So in this little carafe here, mm -hmm. we have a uh, white w wine. Wine, okay. Dump it in. Dump it in, and then you're gonna take your wooden mm. spoon. Deglaze? Deglaze. What is deglazing, Savannah? Scraping the nasty bits off the bottom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, the, I know, the flavor bits. Yes, absolutely. I did learn a deglazing. Um, I love that. All right, you're gonna do, um, not the all that butter actually. You're gonna do four more tablespoons basically. One, yeah. two. Oh, look yeah. at you eyeballing Three. it. Yes. That's impressive. Four. All right. And that goes into the pan. Look at yeah. This is hey, right here. Duty. This is graduate school. <laughs> We're gonna dump in the cooked garlic, all that oil, and mm. the chili. We're gonna let this go. I want you guys to taste it. 
where it is. There's Savannah's golden oh, the box. Golden spoon. But you so have there's one. no lemon yet. It tastes lemony to me now. Really? Oh, from the white wine, right? Oh. And that's going to reduce in Oh down. my! What God, do you think? It's incredible. <laughs> I'm actually just gonna come in. Mm -hmm. What's and this lemon juice? So it's two tablespoons of lemon. We're not gonna do all of it because I wanna do kind of to taste. Mm -hmm. So let's start there, okay. I think. What do you think over there? Or is that done? No, not done. Still not Although, done? Well, actually, I'd like Pilar to test this because. Happy to. Noodles keep cooking. Yeah, and, and we're gonna finish it off in the sauce as well. So this maybe might something. actually be almost Pretty good. there. Uh -uh. Still one more minute. Yeah. Yeah. Almost there. Should I turn it down? So more? Yeah, let's turn it's that really down. going crazy yeah. here. And how's that here sounding now, Pilar? Yeah. <laughs> now we got it. That's on. the sound I want. I like to pick herbs too for like yeah. salads, but oh. for something like this, I'm like, no, that's totally fine. Okay. So you want to get it again. What'd like, you do? Did you cut down. off the stems? I put the stems underneath. So I cut oh. them, cut the stems. Mm -hmm. See, by the way, I'm oh, grabbing this like before this? Yeah. I forget everybody and then tuck just them so them you see it. Oh. Basically. oh, she's saving her pasta water. <laughs> oh, I like your today show theme pasta water. Okay, and then I put the stems under. So, yeah. So yes. I know it's uncomfortable, but yeah. just like you okay. can go slow and you're going to do a rough Because it's ready. Drew reports that the pasta is ready. All right. Okay. And Savannah, you're going to start putting that pasta in. Mm -hmm. And it's Ooh. totally fine that it has the liquid because yeah, that's just going to make a, a, a nicer emulsified sauce. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Look how beautiful that is. Oh my sauce gosh, this is, looks right? incredible. And I think you do need a little bit more pasta water, Drew. Would you oh, think? Just, aren't you just glad a you little, saved it, a Drew? A little bit, a touch. Give me a little splash. That's okay. great. Wow. Yeah. And is the shrimp just the very last thing I put on there? Yes. I like this big old skillet yeah. too. Mm -hmm. It's fun. Makes me feel like a real chef. Um, Savannah, you're gonna kill the heat. Okay. Done. And then you're gonna garnish with your chopped parsley. Right in the bowl, huh? Right in there. And I don't wanna go crazy, right? Just a little like that? Just a, just a little for color and then okay. you can give it a toss again. It's, with, uh, the shrimp oh gosh, is- it looks so good. Perfect. <laughs> like wow. it's ridiculous. And Perfect. how are we gonna plate it? We got a bowl for you. Okay. Yeah, okay. This, part, this is gonna be a little tricky. Um, because this thing weighs six billion pounds. Oh, watch out, watch out. Okay, look, I think we did pretty good. Cool. Oh, yes. I think we did perfect. Look at it. Wow, and then you By can the way, roll. I feel like you should lie in King Yacht now. <laughs> the ball. Oh! <laughs> wow. And then you can serve it with a little bit more fresh parsley, chili okay. flake, lemon. Garnish. Love it. Garnish it up. Just a little bit. We, yeah. we chopped those. Let's go. Yeah. Guys, Shall we? let's chow down. Ah! Let's do it. I mean, this is our garden party. It's so pretty. It is really chowy. Yes. Okay. Please. My first duku. I've never had a duku before. Duka. The duka. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's so good. Mm. You really get those spices. You do. It's delish. 
in the back of the palate and through the nose. Mm. But mm. it's so cold and refreshing. Also, right? And then you have the pickle that comes through that is just like I a little floral. A little... Listen, Ooh. I love that pickle rind. Yeah. I never knew I could feel that way about a watermelon rind. I'm really excited that you're saying that. Me too. That to this is a whole new world for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to show you um, some people call it a nest. Um, I'm really going to focus on the pasta. If I catch a little Clear shrimp so in there, for you. I catch a little shrimp in there. So be it. What are we doing? We're going to make a little round ball. Well, you're supposed to make a pasta nest, but this is not working. And then oh. my tongs also won't go all the way to the. God darn it. <laughs> <laughs> Here, you know what will really help? Let what? me try this again. Let me get it with a fork. Okay. Because that. Um, like a fork I feel oh. like this is gonna, yeah. yeah. There you go. should work much nicer. So wanna nest there me? you go. I want to nest you. Okay. Oh, that's so pretty. And then you just kind of dip the ladle. There you go. Oh my gosh, And fancy then you pants. can unfork it. And then a little bit of shrimp. You're so classy. <laughs> Here. Thank there. you, yeah. Third <laughs> All right, time I need third, a charm. Third time's a charm. I believe in you, Drew. Okay. Right. So. Let's see. I'm oh no, move. you're nesting. Oh, there That's you your go. Best go. Nest yet. There you See? go. See, third time's the charm. Oh, and that then... is beautiful. That's so pretty. Oh, there you go. Go. I'm chowing down. I can't wait yes, anymore. Yes, yes. This is delicious. Mm -hmm. You guys cooked that shrimp like perfectly. The shrimp came out real good. Real right? money. Yeah. Perfect. I agree. Money shrimp. Proud of us. And that like little pop from the shrimp mm. too. That baking mm. soda like really affects the texture, so it feels like super fresh. It does, ladies. I'm so proud of us. Can we raise a glass? To your friendship. To friendship. To your friendship. Cheers. Hi there, happy Thursday. The 2024 presidential race heating up. Yeah, candidates clashing and trading jabs in the final 